to all be the same. You can look the other way. You don't have to be a faceless person in a faceless crowd. It's not compulsory. You can express your uniqueness. You don't have to do what everybody else does just because they do it and we're frightened of conforming. And sometimes the uh, choice of not conforming can actually save us a lot of grief. And it will in the next few years. You don't have to swim with the tide. You can swim the other way. It's possible. You were born an original. Don't die a copy. But how many people do? Because they fear not being like everyone else is because of the comeback from those people. Truth does not change because it is or is not believed by the majority of the people. Everybody knows that, mate. Everyone knows that's rubbish. Well, I don't know it's rubbish. That's one less than everyone. We've made a start. As Gandhi said, even if you're in a minority of one, the truth is still the truth. The multitude is always wrong. My goodness, how history has confirmed that. And this is the stadium on which it all plays out. The human mind. You cannot control billions of people physically. You can in certain small areas, yes, with your tanks and your bloody tasers and all that rubbish, but you can't do it to seven billion. You have to control the way they perceive themselves and the world and therefore through that make them behave the way you want them to. So if we're going to go down this route of freedom, First of all, we need to free our minds from the programming of a lifetime. Free our minds from the belief that what we're programmed to believe in schools is the truth about anything. It's not there to enlighten us, it's there to program us with a certain perception of reality which we carry through our lives so we will be good little slaves based on who we think we are and what we think the world is. Free our minds from the diversions and the nonsense and, hey, honey, she's after the car, quick. And while we're doing that, over here, the world is being orchestrated. Not for our benefit either. Free our minds from the belief that the mainstream media is interested in telling the people the truth of what's out going on in the world. It's there to do the opposite. It's to tell us the version of reality the control system wants us put to believe so we will respond and react in the right way. Free our minds from the fake change people. I mean, crikey, is there a politician that's actually campaigning anymore that's not saying they stand for change? Change? Yes, I tell you what the change is. It's one guy claiming to be changed, controlled by the same force that controlled the previous guy. Free our minds from the fake, fraudulent, false flag terrorist events created by the same control system that then tells you how the world must change to save us from the terrorism that they had covertly created. Free our minds from the front men for this control system who are put up to frighten us into uh, accepting changes in society, surveillance and control to save us from people who are front men for the very system that says, let me save you from him. Free our minds from the bullshit nonsense about human-caused global warming, which is nothing more than a, a, a way of introducing and justifying more and more controls and massive, massive increases in taxation making fortunes for people like him. Free our minds from the idea that Big Pharma, the pharmaceutical industry, is in any way interested in human health. It's not about human health, it's about Big Pharma wealth and more. Free our minds from the four-letter word that controls the world, fear, that traps us in these vibrational boxes called fear. And Free our minds, more than anything else, from the idea that we are Charlie Jones or Ethel Smith. We're just Joe Public. We've got no power. The choice is to become conscious, to realize 
that Ethel Smith is an experience, not who we are. And choose not to be what the control system is fast trying to create. Since I started writing about this in some detail 15, 16, 17 years ago about the control system, it's, it's, gone, it's gone from its coming to daily experience. I think this is a symbolic picture myself. That plaque says, George Orwell lived here. <laughs> We've got peaceful demonstrations in America being scattered by excruciatingly painful sound technology. The microchip agenda's moving on. The sky's full of chemtrails and all the stuff that's in them. The food we are given to eat, if we choose to eat it, is full of uh, chemical cocktails that are destabilizing our ability to think straight and be emotionally stable. And they're targeting the children more than anyone because they're the ones who are supposed to live most of their lives in this control system. They bloody won't, as I'll get to later, but they're trying. And yet so many people are still saying, well, it looks all right to me. Looks all right to me. To have your head in the sand, you have to be on your knees. The two go together. <laughs> ain't, it great, ain't it great to be free? See, the idea is to enslave us while people think they're free. And this is a, this is a real important area that keeps us from focusing on this and act, acting on this. Wishful thinking. Wishful thinking that says, well, I don't want it to be true, so I'm going to kid myself it's not. And if I can do that, then I don't have to do anything. Here's an example of uh, wishful thinking I came across. Wishful thinking that this threat will make any difference to their husband's drinking. That's wishful thinking. <laughs> when I first saw that, I immediately ordered a large one, personally. I don't... <laughs> but that's wishful thinking. I wish it were different. I wish things were different. Well, we all do, but they're not. They are as they are, and I find myself saying this all the time now. It is what it is. And if you accept what it is, you can change what it is. If you're in denial of it, you're not going to change it because you're kidding yourself it doesn't exist. This control system is coming in. It's coming in fast at the moment. And we have to get it from talking about it to doing something about it. And it's crept up on us step by step while we're watching the game shows and celebrity world and sport and stuff. Nothing wrong with any of those things. But if you're there and you've not got the peripheral vision, they will keep you from seeing what's going on. And now the future is here. It's not sometime, never. The future is here. And we've got to go from that to that pretty damn quick. And we can and we will in many, many ways. As Martin Luther King said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. And we are at a time of challenge and controversy, and we'll see what we're bloody made of, frankly. But the great news is, and I'm going to get into this big time in the last section, this is a time of fantastic awakening. You know, like I say, when I started on this journey, consciously anyway, 20 years ago, the number of people that were in any way interested in this information, whether it's the nature of reality or, or the, 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 the control system and, and its agenda, was tiny, tiny, tiny. It was a lonely road. Not anymore. A phenomenal, phenomenal awakening is happening all over the world as people start to expand their minds and open their minds to another possibility, to another world, to another sense of self. And what comes with that awakening. Indeed, what triggers it in so many ways is when we decide to ask the big questions. Because only then can we get the big answers. Like, who are we? Where are we? What is reality? And that's what I'm going to focus on in this first section. Because unless we at least understand the themes of what reality is, we cannot possibly, possibly understand 
what's happening in the world and how the control system really works and how deep the rabbit hole goes. Establishment science, education, media, that's what it does. I mean, have you seen these politicians in Britain now? You've got Clegg uh, in the Liberal Party, Liberal Democrats. You've got Cameron in the Conservatives. You're going to probably have one of the Milibands, maybe David Miliband, leader of the other major party. And they're all standing on the same stod in postage stamp, all three of them. Same background, same basic perception of the world and politics, and that's exactly the same with science, education, and media. They all stand on this same postage stamp, and anyone wants to step off it and explore in other areas, stop him, stop him! Ridicule, condemnation, stop his funding. And people say, well, if what you're saying is true, science would tell us. Yeah, okay, like the media would tell us, right? Yeah, okay. What the control system doesn't want us to know is that this reality, in terms of its physicality, the one we think we're experiencing now, is an illusion. There is no physicality. There is no out there. Everything I'm looking at now out there is going on in here. I'll come to how that works. It is so simple. As the great American comedian Bill Hicks said, Great, great man. All matter is merely energy condensed to a slow vibration. We're all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. There's no such thing as death. Life is only a dream, and we are the imagination of ourselves. And that's the control system's bottom line, manipulating our imagination of self. You can trick the brain into seeing things that aren't there. These are pictures of paintings, etc., on the flat surface, the flat road, the flat pavement. And yet you can trick the brain into reading them as three-dimensional. That's on a flat pavement. So is that. Is that a woman's face or is it a flower and a butterfly? Very easy to trick the brain to decode reality in a certain way. For instance, is this a man and a hand, or is it a Mexican, a woman, a bush, and a dog? Depends how you decode it. And the control system, en masse, is manipulating 24-7 the way that we decode reality. So we decode it in line with what suits the control system. As Einstein said, reality is an illusion, albeit a persistent one. And the reason it's persistent is because we live in a virtual reality universe. A fantastically expanded, advanced version of a gigantic computer game. And the analogies go one after the other. Today, it's much easier to talk about reality because technology is starting to mirror the very reality that we're experiencing. It's getting closer and closer to real. And the projection is that not too long from now, they will have computer games which you could hardly tell the difference between that and this. We're having training simulations and flying simulations. They're in some hospitals using virtual reality images to show patients when their burns are being treated, and they, they show them very, very pictures, very, very cold images, and the brain decodes that and cools the skin down. And when you look at these advanced virtual reality technologies, what are they doing? They're just hijacking the way the five senses work anyway. They're using the eyes, they're using through these gloves, the, the, the sense of touch and all the rest of it. And they are feeding information, digital information, to the brain and tricking it to believe that something's going on which is not. And that's what the, how the control system works. And we have what I call the body computer, the biological body computer. Biological, by, by that I mean it has the ability not just to react to data, but to uh, assess that data and make decisions on it, which is what the immune system is doing all now as we speak. I'm not standing here, you're not sitting there saying, OK, uh, problem with the right leg, go down there, bit on the left. No, it's just doing it. Because it's thinking, it's a biological computer system. By the way, this uh, image here was taken the split second that someone told this guy 
that Barack Obama had won the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> That's how I reacted anyway. And the base foundation of this virtual reality is actually waveform, vibrating energy. And within waveforms, as scientists will tell you, fantastic amounts of information can be stored. And that's what the base information construct of this reality is. It's information in wave form. And what I'm going to call that through the day is the metaphysical universe. When I talk about the metaphysical universe, I mean the wave form level of this universe before it becomes this. What happens is the waveform information construct is decoded through the body computer into the world that we think we are experiencing. It's all going on in here. And it's like, as I'll come to in a second, it's almost a mirror, though much more advanced, of the wireless internet, where you can get a computer and you can pull the wireless internet, the World Wide Web, a whole collective reality out of the unseen to appear on a screen anywhere in the world. And so as we decode vibrational information through to electrical information, which is uh, sent to the brain, and the brain decodes that into the world that we think we are experiencing. This is the metaphysical universe. Through the body computer, it becomes the world that we experience as outside of us. The five senses, which of course, as I say, virtual reality computer games lock into, that's how they work, they change vibrational information into electrical information which goes to the brain to be decoded into what is holographic information. I'll come to that. So this is absolutely right, this, this scene from The Matrix, where the Neo character says, this isn't real. And Morpheus says, what is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, taste, and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. That's all it is. And imagine if you can manipulate the way the brain interprets reality because you know how reality works and the population doesn't because you bloody well keep it from them systematically. The five senses are a decoding system. The most obvious one, of course, is sound. That's a vibration comes to the ear, message to the brain, brain hears the sound. There is no sound until we've decoded it as so. Sound is just a vibration until we've decoded it. Sound exists in here. Same with taste. Electrical signals to the brain decodes it. This is how you can, through stage hypnotists, etc., get someone to eat a potato but taste an apple. Because you implant the belief here that it's an apple, and so the uh, electrical signal with the, the potato code goes there, and it doesn't read it like that. It reads it as an apple. Even on that basic level, think of the potential for manipulating the way we see reality individually and collectively. And different parts of the brain, like with smell, are specifically there in the body computer to decode uh, those senses. Same with touch, exactly the same. Even movement. There is no movement until we've decoded that movement. There are uh, conditions of the brain, which some people have, where they don't decode movement. So often they don't even see it. They'll see a car in the distance, the next thing, whoom, it's gone. Nothing in the middle. They see someone pouring a, a, a cup of tea, and all they see is a static arc of tea. It's all an illusion. It's a computer game. A very, very sophisticated one. I love that. Crikey. Talk about having a laugh. Hey, Ethel, come and see who's in the telly. <laughs> Don't you mean on the telly? No. Stage hypnotists are playing with this system all the time, like I say. And there are some other hypnotists I made earlier. These don't know they're hypnotists, most of them anyway. But that's what they're doing. They are, all the time, giving us a sense of reality, a belief in what is real. And if the brain takes on that belief system, it then starts reading reality in line with that belief. And it becomes a self 
fulfilling reality. So we live in the equivalent, as I'll keep saying, a very, very advanced equivalent of the holographic uh, internet, the World Wide Web. If you say to people, tell me about the internet, they say, yeah, well, it's graphics and websites and words and colors and the pictures. Yes, it is. But the only place that exists in that form, the internet, is on the screen. Everywhere else, it's electrical circuits, etc., etc. You say, tell me about television. They'll say, well, it's moving pictures on a screen. Yes, it is. But the only place that television exists in that, in that form is on the screen. Everywhere else, it's electrical circuits and in some cases still, many cases still, broadcast frequencies. And we live in a, what I call the cosmic internet, where information in the energy around us, I'll come to where it comes from in a minute, is then pulled out of the uh, unseen. Just as these guys sitting out in the open, no wires, no connections, they are pulling the unseen out onto the computer screen. And if you think of it, because people say, well, if you're creating your own reality in your head and all that stuff, why do we all see the same stage? Why do we all see the same car? Well, when you log on the internet in South Africa or Australia or London or America or anywhere, apart from places like China, you log on to the very same collective reality as everywhere else, everywhere in the world. You might choose to go to this website, and if you go to this website, the guy in South Africa will be, could go to the same website that you're on and see the same thing, because it's a collective reality. What happens is that we then decide, do we like this website? What do we think of it? Do I want to go there, or do I want to go there? That's how we put our individual spin on it. It's the same when you look out the, the window and you see the same car going past, but I might like the car, someone else might not like the car, but it's the same collective reality. And the body computer is pulling this reality out of the unseen, just like uh, those laptops. And so you've got in the Matrix movie that scene where he says, the Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us, even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out of your window or you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? that you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch, a prison for your mind. I'll get into the nature of that prison in the second section. So what is this universe? It's information. And it's information decoding information. Just as you put um, a computer disk in a computer, it's information. The information encoded in the computer then reads the information on the disk. That's what we're doing. And that way, we manifest this apparently out there reality. We too, the, the so-called human body, is energetic, non-physical in its base form. But when it comes through the decoding system, it becomes the world that we think we're experiencing outside, <clears throat> outside of us. It seems to be outside, outside of us, I'll grant you. My God, I look out here, it looks to be outside of me. But it's inside of us. We are creating it through the decoding system in our heads. Now, I'll go into this, go into this area in, 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 in the new book. What I'm saying is that, well, I'm not saying this, scientists are now saying this. At the center of this galaxy is a massive black hole, and the increasing thinking is, and I would say it fits perfectly, is that there is a giant black hole at the center of every galaxy. What I'm saying is this, these black holes resonate the base information or the base vibrational frequency of this virtual reality universe. And they interact with what we call the suns. In this case, our sun in this solar system, but of course there's suns all over the place. I'm saying that this vibration triggers from the suns, depending on its vibrational state, because it changes, and that answers a lot of things, as I'll come to shortly. It triggers information of certain kinds being transmitted by the sun, the suns in general, in the form of photons. Photons are the base uh, unit of what we call light and other forms of electromagnetic radiation. They carry information. These photons being generated out of the suns, triggered by this vibrational base frequency, 
uh, coming from the black holes, create the cosmic wireless internet within our reality. And that's what we are decoding. The Earth decodes it. It's photon energy, photon information that is passing through the Earth energy grid. It is photon information, what the Chinese in their acupuncture uh, disciplines call qi. That qi is actually photon energy. It is information, which the body computer then is decoding into this collective reality. And just like on the internet, where you can see information and receive it, but you can also post information, so we're interacting with this virtual reality universe and changing it subtly as we put our unique spin on things. And we're creating that world that I keep talking about. Now, some scientists over the years have postulated that this physical world only exists when it's observed. I agree. Why? Because of this. When you put a computer disk into a computer, it does not read all the information on the disk at the same time. It reads that part that it is observing, whatever that laser is hitting at the time. All the other stuff is still in information form. It's not been transferred to the screen as pictures, etc. And we do the same. When we observe, decode, then we bring it into this reality. But without that, this is just the base vibrational metaphysical universe, which is the base of, basis of all of it. Then no light gets in the brain. So how do we see light? How can I look at that light and see it? No light ever gets in the brain because the brain's decoding information into that light. So when you see things like in the Matrix movies, those, those lines like, there is no spoon. It is not the spoon that bends, it is only yourself. Exactly. Because the only place the spoon exists in physical form is in here. And you bend it by bending the way you decode reality. Miracles are simply overcoming the programming of what's possible and not possible. You know, we of course program to believe that when you walk through fire, you get burned. And if you walk through fire or hot coals with that belief, that decoding state, you'll burn your bloody feet. But as so many people have shown, if you can go into another state of consciousness and override that, you can walk across hot coals and not feel a thing. Why? Because an illusion cannot burn an illusion unless you believe it can. There are no miracles. There's just understanding how to manifest all possibility. And that understanding comes from the fact that we acknowledge, we understand that we are consciousness. Disembodied, no form awareness, having an experience. Like a Central American shaman said, we are perceivers, we are awareness, we are not objects, we have no solidity. We, or rather our reason, forget this, and thus we entrap the totality of ourselves in a vicious circle from which we rarely emerge in our lifetime. And that vicious circle is what the control system wants to keep us in, because then we're controllable. If we understand who we really are, what we really are, it's impossible to control by a, a bunch of control freaks. The body is the way our awareness experiences this reality. If I want to interact with this reality, which is a, a, a frequency range, I have to have an outer shell, we all do, that vibrates within this frequency range, because our consciousness is vibrating much too quickly. It's like Radio 1 trying to make a uh, connection to Radio 2. They're on different wavelengths, never going to happen. So we take on this outer projection we call a body, and therefore I can pick this up and interact with this reality. What the control system wants us to do is to believe that that projection, that vehicle to experience this reality is who we are, because then we go from, I am all that is, has been, and ever will be. I'm Charlie Smith. I'm Ethel Jones. I've got no power. 
It's the whole bottom line of it. We say I'm going on the internet. We don't go on the internet. The computer goes on the internet. And we observe the internet through the computer. And our mind body is the vehicle to experience this reality. That goes on the internet. Consciousness, the real us, observes, just like the World Wide Web, observes the internet through that vehicle. And like I say, the idea is to get us to think that we're that and not that. I had a, a vision when I was sitting in the bath a couple of years ago now, maybe. And I've asked my, my great friend, uh, the brilliant Neil Haig, to uh, knock this up from what I saw. I'm sitting in my bath, and I saw billowing energy, yellow, kind of white yellow energy. And I took that immediately to be consciousness. Then an eye appeared in the energy, the consciousness, and then a telescope appeared. At the end of the telescope was this reality, the Earth, the solar system, whatever. And the last movement was for the telescope to morph into a human body. And that was so profound in the sense of that's how it works. And because of the limitations of this focus, we see ourselves, if we don't stay in contact with that, in very limited terms. Death. He's just putting the telescope down. Well, I've had enough of that. Earth's a shitty place. Hello, all right, I'm back. You never went away. The computer's here. We are observing through the computer. And I want to make the difference, because this will go through the day, the difference between consciousness and what I call the mind. Everything is the same energy in the end, because it's just one unified awareness I call the infinite but it takes different expressions. Consciousness is the ocean. All possibility, all that is. All awareness. And the mind is like a frozen, denser expression of that. And therefore has great, great limitations in terms of awareness and perception compared with that. And one of the reasons is to interact with this reality which is much denser than consciousness, it ha we have to have a denser conduit, which we call the mind-body. Therefore, it has to be more limited than consciousness itself. This guy, uh, Ramana Maharshi, a man who lived in India and meditated for most of his life on a mountain in India. I've actually been there. Nice place. He said, mind is consciousness which is put on limitations. You are originally unlimited and perfect. Later, you take on limitations and become the mind. Or as uh, Einstein put it, a human being is part, a part of the whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts, his feeling as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. And that optical delusion comes from looking through the lens, the telescope. And what it does, and I keep saying the control system is structured exactly to do this, it puts us in a false identity. One that doesn't think all possibility, it thinks limitation, I can't, that's not possible. And if you want to control people en masse, you want them in that mode. I'm not David Icke. David Icke's my experience. It's a name for the experience I'm having at the moment. I am all consciousness, all awareness. All that is, has been, and ever will be, and so is everyone else in this room, everyone else in all the realities of this infinite world that we live in. We are all possibility, and that's our base state. I don't care who you are, what you are, what you've done in your life, what regrets you have, how successful you've been, your base state is all possibility. And I, I've only taken psychoactive drugs once, well, one and a half times. The main one was in Peru when I took something called ayahuasca in 2003 and for five hours I had this voice as loud as mine is now took female form talking to me about the illusory nature of reality and when I came back out uh, to, to Britain it happened in the Brazilian rainforest I started following up names dates places type information what I was told and it was extraordinarily accurate it's amazing that 
Mainstream science has sussed most of this, but doesn't realize it as because the two, all the disciplines don't talk to each other. When you connect the dots, you realize they've already uh, established that this is an illusion. But that doesn't go down well because it's too close to the truth. And what, how I experience that state beyond this world, beyond vibration, was a stillness and silence. And that's what all possibility is, the stillness and the silence. There was a great line that that voice, that voice said to me when it was explaining the nature of reality. It said, if it vibrates, it's illusion. If it vibrates, it's illusion, because our core level is stillness and silence. I experienced that. Amazing feeling. There are no negative emotions, there's no fear, there's no worry about not making the rent and all this stuff. They've all gone in that realm. And people think of nothing. All that is, has been, whatever can be. That's all potential, all knowing. And everywhere and nowhere. People think that's a paradox. You can't be everywhere and nowhere, but you can in all possibility. In all possibility, everything is possible. So everywhere is nowhere. Nowhere is everywhere. Everything and nothing. Again, not a paradox. All possibility is everything and nothing. And as I was saying, we, we, we think of nothing as nothing's there. There, there. there is nothing. But within the nothing, within the silence, is everything. Within the silence, for instance, is all possibility. And then when I start talking, I have pulled one possibility out of all possibility, which is manifest as vibration, my voice. And then I stop. It goes back into all possibility. We don't think that this building is defined by the nothing. We think it's defined by the something. But the something is only there, and this building is only in its, pre is in its form because of the no-thing, apparently no-thing, in between what we perceive as the something. The silence. Is, this is why when people are in silence, they go somewhere else. And so many people are frightened of the silence. Get in the car, whack the record on, get in home, put the telly on, noise, noise. Hold you in five cents reality. When people go into the silence, that's when they get their insights because they're accessing other levels of themselves beyond the five senses. So out of the nothing comes the realm of form. This is something called cymatics. If you go on the uh, um, internet, you can see it, uh, videos of it, like YouTube. What they, what they do is they put particles on a metal plate and they play sound across it. And it's incredible. It just forms into these amazing geometrical shapes just because of the sound. And when the sound stops, boom, it all goes back to all over the place. And then the sound changes and another form comes in. And these worlds of form, frequencies, vibrating frequencies, are created in this way, out of all possibility. And there are endless, infinite realms with different so-called laws of physics, different challenges, different experiences, all vibrating at different speeds and therefore able to share the same space. All of these different realms are sharing the same space that I'm sharing now, just as all the radio and television stations broadcasting to this city are sharing the space that I'm sharing now and the space that they're sharing with each other. So we live in a frequency range, and that frequency range is dictated by the range of frequencies that our body computers can decode. And it is extraordinarily tiny. We're virtually blind in terms of what exists. The vast majority of this universe is what scientists call dark energy or dark matter. And they call it dark, not because it's pitch black, but because we cannot decode it. Therefore, it is not in our realm of experience. We have to work it out by its impact on things that we can see. And the electromagnetic spectrum is 0.005% of what is projected to exist in this universe. And visible light, which is the only frequency range that we can decode, is a fraction of the 0.005%. So this is it. Visible light. This is our world. And we look out and we think, 
we can see everything. But we can't. We can see what we can decode. And therefore, we operate within a dimension, we might call it, and it's penetrated by other dimensions, which allows those other dimensions to interact with ours, which I'm going to get to in the second section because that is fundamental to the control system. What we're doing is we are putting our focus of attention into this reality through the body computer, and therefore this seems to be the only world that exists. But the space we're occupying is teeming, teeming with life of endless varieties. So if we come into this world of mind and we hold a connection to consciousness we are in this world physically and we can experience this we're going to the pub yeah let's have a beer with the yeah but we're not of this world in terms of the point of observation we are in this world but we're observing it from here we can see things here that this can't see and that's why the control system has to keep us here and a structured society to make that happen to keep us in bewilderment by being only able to decode and experience reality through the five senses. And once you are in the five senses and you're not getting inspiration, insight, intuitive knowing from higher levels of your consciousness, where do you look to get a fix on who you are, where you are, and the world you're living in? There. And who controls that? The control system that controls the media, politics, education, science. The idea is isolate us in the five senses, isolate us in body-mind, and then program the body-mind to see the world that suits the control system. Time and space are just information within the metaphysical universe fabric, the vibrational fabric, which we then decode into what appears to be time and space. There is no time and space. When you put a disk in a computer, it's got information on it. You put it in the, in, in the computer, the computer reads it. On the screen, you see time and space, or what appears to be time and space. But all it is is information on the disk being read by the computer and being put on the screen. That's what we, we are doing all the time. Time's an illusion. And my goodness me, if we fall for that, then uh, we totally get encompassed by time that time exists, you can, you can, you can say it's, it's one o'clock, I've got to meet someone at one o'clock, so you're there at the same time, and you synchronize that, but all, the, all, all along you, you know that it's just, it's just a construct. It's not, it's not part of you this time. Because no time is where consciousness operates. And if we operate completely connected to time, then by that very nature we're going to disconnect from consciousness, which is on another level of perception. Our time is just crazy. Uh, you cross a, an invisible line in the ocean, you go into tomorrow, you go the other way, you go into yesterday. There is only the now. That's all there is. People say, no, no, there's the past and there's the future. Well, okay. When you think of the future, where are you? You're in the now. When you think of the past, memories, where are you? You're in the now. These are constructs. These are perceptions. They're not real. Only thing that's real is now. Everything happens in the now. And the only moment we can change anything is in the now. And if we get pulled into the past, all regret, I wish I had, oh, that woman in 1953, ooh. Or we get pulled into the future, oh my God, what's going to happen? Oh, yeah, outcome, oh, what if, what if, what if? Then we're getting pulled out of the only time that exists, and therefore our power to change things to impact on now is diluted. And we are absolutely dominated by time. What's the time? Oh my God, is that the time? Oh my goodness, what's going to happen? Are you going to get time? Oh, I'm late. And yet, the now is the only thing that exists, and time, like space, is a perception. It is part of the construction of reading. You could see time in a way like uh, like a disc, like a, like a DVD. What you've seen in the film is your past, you, as you perceive the past. What you're looking at in the film at that moment you perceive as the present 
and what you've yet to see in the film you perceive as the future. Yet all that information exists on that disk at the same time. Whip back a bit, you've gone into the past. Whip forward, you've gone into the future. And I've uh, been talking for years about the time loop, as I call it. Wrote a book with that title. And it's not really a loop, but it does expre can express itself like that in the play-out world of so-called physical reality. And we go round and round and round, and it comes back to the start. And we think we're going forward, but because we're only in it for a certain section, we think we're going forward. If we stayed with it, it would come basically back to the start. It's like a, a place of experience, and depending on what we wish to experience depends on what part of the, of the loop that we decide to experience. Because, as I said earlier, this vibration, and by the way, this vibration coming out of the black holes vibrates in the now. It doesn't move through time. It, it carries the encoded information that we decode as time, but it vibrates in the now. But it doesn't vibrate just the same forever. It goes through a cycle, a vibrational cycle, changes. And as it changes, it elicits different information from the suns, which we then decode and as we do so, the world moves on, experience moves on through different epochs. You look at the ancients around the world, and they invariably see time as secular. Uh, you have, of course, the famous yugas in Indian belief, Hindu belief, where the world goes through different cycles. You have a golden age when everything is expansive and everything's fully integrated and connected. And then you have other yugas which are suppressed and you have control and you do not have the expansive awareness that you had before. It's a different kind of experience. And so as this vibration changes, it takes this reality through a cycle and then comes back again. This is where all these yugas come in. And what happens is the left part half of the brain particularly decodes these, this information which is vibrating in the now, it decodes it into a sequence. It's what some brain scientists call the left brain a serial processor. And it's this sequence that it puts the information in that appears to be the passage of time from past to future. The quicker it decodes it, the quicker time seems to move, the slower it decodes it, the reverse. This is why, as Einstein said, if you're in the company of a beautiful woman, time can uh, pass very quickly, but if you're in a dentist chair, it can pass very slowly because your brain is decoding reality in a different way, putting it into a sequence in a different way. And so the time loop is actually just the decoding of this changing vibration, changing information. And again, if you can hold connection to out there, you can be in the world and not of it. If you're not, you're literally caught in the loop, and that's where most people have been for a very long time. Now, as I say, the, the, the body is a biological computer, and I, I'll get through this per, per part pretty quickly because I've been through this uh, before in the talks and stuff, but it's very important to keep connecting the dots. So, the body computer is our vehicle to experience this virtual reality, consciousness to experience it. Um, it's like, you know, you, you want to go to um, experience another planet, you need an outer shell. As I said earlier, we need an outer shell vibrating within the frequency of this reality. And this is what makes racism so ludicrous, so insane, such a confirmation of ignorance. Because it's just a vehicle to experience this reality. And racism is the final confirmation that you are caught in five sense reality and have not a clue of the nature of what we all are, racist and non-racist, and that is consciousness. Humans, we think we're humans, we're, we're human. Humans are like a software program. We're not human. We're experiencing being a human. We are consciousness having that experience. As this uh, article in uh, the San Francisco Chronicle said, DNA is a universal software code. From bacteria to humans, the basic instructions for life are written with the same language. And there are four codes, A, C, G, and T, or in my case, G and T, G and T, G and T. I like that one. It's in my DNA. And how these codes are in relation to each other decides if the outer shell is a human, a mouse, a virus, anything. And it very much connects into those uh, green codes on the computer screens in the Matrix movies. And the body computer, biological computer, has the ability to think and assess for itself, um, ticks every box when you go through it. The reason they're now talking about connecting the brain to desktop computers is because they are 
connecting two computers. One far more, infinitely more advanced, yes, but two computers. That's how it's possible. Um, when uh, the computer won't work, won't turn on, won't process, we say the computer's dead. You drop a computer from a top floor, it will smash and it will be dead. You drop a human computer, it will smash and be dead. Because that's all that happens at death, the computer dies. We don't bloody die. There is no death, we're consciousness, infinite consciousness. The, the computer goes into sleep mode just to tick over. We go into sleep mode just to tick over. We have antivirus technology in computers to seek out the viruses that are a danger to the computer's systems and what you might call health. We have a phenomenal antivirus system we call the human immune system, which does exactly the same. And when you have a, a, a virus system and a new virus comes up, they have to update it because it can't work out how to stop it, because it's not been programmed to. This is updated by reacting and then uh, integrating that so that the next time that comes, it can deal with it. This is a, an enhanced uh, photograph taken at the Necker Hospital in Paris when they put tracer dye into the acupuncture points and then photographed it. And the tracer dye went through these lines of energy in the body, the chi, the, 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 the photons. And when you look at it, it's just like a motherboard. And interestingly, when this chi is passing around too slowly or too quickly, the body is ill in some way. And what acupuncture is about is using the uh, needles and other techniques to balance out that flow of energy. And what happens when the information is passing around a desktop computer in less than optimal speed. You say, my bloody computer's slow today, and often it's slow because it has a virus. The brain is the central processing unit of the computer, which in a, in a desktop is a, is a microchip. It's the main processor of information. The DNA is the hard drive, and it's not just the DNA we see physically, because even DNA is just the decoded version of an energy field. Um, we have a, an energy counterpart, which we call the human aura. What we call cultures, I'm this culture, I, I'm, I'm a black South African, I'm a, a Hindu or whatever. These are different sub-softwares of the human software. This guy, William Sheridan, um, was in a New York hospital waiting for a heart transplant, and he joined an art therapy course. He was about as good as I am, and I'm... I'm a terrible, terrible artist. And this is what he was drawing. After his heart transplant, suddenly he went back on the th art therapy course and started drawing much more sophisticated pictures. As a result of agreeing to promote organ donation, he managed to meet the donor's mother. He asked her the obvious question, did your son have an interest in art? And she said he wanted art materials rather than toys from the age of 18 months. He was crazy about art. And there have been many studies, some of them very extensive over the years, that have shown the incredible uh, connection between people who've received hearts, lungs, and other organs from people, and then taken on either and or their character traits or their abilities. Because what are they doing? They're downloading information from one computer to another. That's how it gets passed across. Credo Mutwa, the great Zulu shaman in South Africa told me that in the days when they used to eat people in Africa, one of the golden rules was that you must heat the person to a certain temperature, otherwise if you eat them, you become them. Same principle. We are led to believe that what identifies us with the body and what identifies us with the body being us is whether we're a man or a woman. Again, being a man or a woman is not what we are, it's the experience that we're having. How can it we be a man and a woman, or how can that be what we are, when you can change from a man to a woman through chemical intervention? It's changing the nature of the computer through chemical intervention. Freaky the chicken, who was uh, in the papers a few years ago, started out life as a hen, laying eggs, then had a massive, for some reason, uh, explosion of testosterone, and became a cockerel started chasing the chickens, uh, the hens, and crowing at dawn, grew a comb. How can male or female be what we are 
when that can happen. It's an experience for consciousness, which is neither male or female, because it's all possibility. This is from the BBC uh, website. Scientists have been able to take control of flies' brains to make females behave just like males. Researchers genetically modified the insects so that a group of brain cells that control sexual behavior could be switched on by a pulse of light. The team was able to get female fruit flies to produce a courtship song behavior usually only seen in males. Just so you manipulate the computer. Why do birds suddenly start singing together when the sun comes up? I mean, is there someone with a bat on? Go! Why did Freaky the chicken start crowing at dawn when the testosterone came in? It's a program. It's the same with um, emotions, where we think the emotions are who we are. But you can fundamentally change your emotional state through drugs, through chemicals, through things like mercury. Mercury uh, in, in fillings can change your personality. You can change your personality by drinking the shite in, in, in food and drink, these chemical cocktails. That's what's happening to so many kids. How can, how can even emotions, as we know them, be what we are when chemicals can change the emotions that we have? It's to do with the way we decode reality. And uh, we are receiver transmitters of information. Like we're taking from the worldwide cosmic web and we're adding to it. And how interesting and appropriate that one of the great ways or great means of receiving and transmitting is through crystals, quartz crystals. And it turns out the human body is a gigantic liquid quartz crystal. The membrane of every cell, and we have trillions of them, is a quartz crystal, a liquid crystal. The earth is a gigantic crystal. Every grain of sand, for goodness sake, is a crystal. And the earth, too, is receiving and transmitting information within this cosmic web. DNA is a receiver transmitter of information, and it's made that way. This is an article on DNA. From the characteristic form of this giant molecule, a wound double helix, the DNA represents an ideal electromagnetic antenna. On one hand, it is elongated and thus a blade which can take up very well electrical pulses. On the other hand, seen from above, it has the form of a ring and thus is a very magnetical antenna. We are receiving and transmitting all the time through what we think is the body computer. And the energetic auric field connects into us through what we call chakra points, from a word, Sanskrit word meaning wheels of light. And these connect into what we call the physical body through the endocrine uh, system of glands, two of which include the pituitary and the pineal gland, which together make up what we call the third eye. The ability to get out there through the sixth sense. It's like that Muse song says, if you could, we could flick a switch and open your third eye, we would know that they'd never be afraid to die. Words to that effect, exactly, because we'd be out there. Now, anything that can shut these down holds us in five sense reality and stops us from breaking out into the greater self. That's where they want us and that's where they've got so many people, the vast majority, in that state, in a false identity. The world looks so solid, I grant you, but it can't be. It can't be, even though it seems to be. And if you bang your head on the wall, again, like walking through the fire, believing you're going to get burned, bang, you'll bang your head. But it can't be, because the world is made up of atoms, and as quantum physicists have shown, atoms have no solidity. How can something which is basically empty space make up a solid world? It can't. The reason it appears to is because the information in the waveform metaphysical universe is decoded through into apparent solidity. Again, it's just the way we decode reality that gives it form. We take information from a disk, we put it on the screen, it seems to have time-space solidity, but it doesn't. It's just information being read, and that's exactly what's happening to us. The reason it appears solid and it appears three-dimensional is because we live in a holographic world. We see holograms, you can buy them in the shops, where they appear to be three-dimensional, but actually they're not. It's just the illusion of the way they're made. And how they make them is they have a laser, part of it goes across the object they want to photograph, 
Another part goes directly onto a photographic plate, and then the part that's passed across the object goes onto that plate, and they collide. Those two parts of the laser collide, and they create, here we go, a waveform. We call it in uh, holographics an interference pattern. It's like dropping two pebbles in a pond, and then the waves they create collide, and that is a waveform representation of where those pebbles fell, how heavy they were, how high they fell from, etc., how big they were, etc. And this is what the waveform, again, looks like on a holographic print. It's information. It seems to be nothing. It looks like a fingerprint, appropriately, actually. But what is it? But you fire a laser at that, and suddenly a three-dimensional, and the best of them, a very solid-looking image comes up. This is how we create our reality. It's holographic. This guy um, is in an, in an Australian city, I think it was Melbourne, but he was projected as a hologram onto a stage in Adelaide. This is one that CNN did. So we are creating a holographic uh, version of this information, just like a hologram does in our heads. That's where it comes from, it's this construct. And how funny, I've been saying this for years, and then um, I come across this very, very mainstream New Scientist magazine uh, in January now 2009, and it's front page, you are a hologram projected from the edge of the universe. You don't need to go through great swathes of academia. In fact, it's, 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 it's often the worst thing that can happen, because it puts you in, 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 in the box on the postage stamp, often, to understand reality. You just have to access that which is all around us, containing that knowledge. And then you have the question, how can something be a waveform and a particle at the same time, which is what quantum physics has, has found and gone, what? How can that be? Very simple. When you're creating a hologram, the waveform doesn't disappear when the hologram uh, projects itself. They both exist at the same time, the information construct and the decoded uh, holographic form. The particle and the waveform exist at the same time. It's so bloody simple. People think it's so complex. One of the great things about a hologram is that every part of the hologram is a smaller version of the whole. So if you cut a holographic print into four and put a laser onto the four pieces, you don't get a quarter size version of the whole picture, uh, or quarter size part of the whole picture, you get a quarter size version of the entire picture. And because of that, this is why these things happen. This is why reflexologists can find points on the hand and the feet and elsewhere that relate to different organs and parts of the body. This is how uh, acupuncture can do it, and, and reflexology, with, with the points on the ear. Do something here, it affects the heart. Do something here, it affects the liver. Because it's a hologram, and it must be like that, because every part of the hologram is a smaller part of the whole. Holographic Blood, this uh, book by uh, uh, an American physician called Harvey Biggleton, I went to see. He has found um, holographic images in the blood. And I looked uh, through one of his m really powerful microscopes, and <laughs> As he increased it and increased it and increased it, my blood went from blood as you would perceive it to quartz crystal when you, you, you got it to the most powerful level. That's what we are, crystals. So because we live in a holographic reality where everything is a smaller version of the whole, that's where we get this, the theme of as above, so below. That's why the human energy field is mirrored by the earth energy field because we are a smaller part of the Earth hologram, and the Earth hologram is a smaller part of the greater hologram. And on one level, this reality is digital. And they're creating now, and this is extremely relevant to what I've been saying, they're creating now digital holograms that operate in a slightly different way to the holograms we've had before. And some of these digital holograms, that's one, are being used at um, promotions to sell products and stuff, and people are frightened to walk through the hologram because it looks so solid. And that's what this is, digital holograms. Digital holograms is the reality that we're experiencing in what I call the play-out world. 
And this is why uh, numbers, numerology works. Numerology can um, predict things and it can make things happen because it is working on this digital level of reality. Computers work on binary systems of on-off electrical charges, just symbolized as one and naught. They're now starting to develop um, trinary computers with a third number. And the human brain works how? On binary and trinary on-off, etc., electrical charges. And of course, the uh, AC, G, and C codes of the DNA are all connect into this. So while in the Matrix movies we saw the projection of beyond the physical world, it was a digital world, so is ours, that's exactly what it is. And like I say, scientists are not sussing any of this stuff in terms of the mainstream, because they focus on their own discipline, their own individual dot, and they don't connect the dots, and therefore they can't see the picture. I watched a, um, I watched a program the other day, it was a mainstream science program, and it asked the question for at least an hour, I think it was an hour, what's the biggest number? And they were going to these bloody numbers that went on and on and on and on, disappearing up there, trying to work it out. Well, I'll tell you the biggest number. That's the biggest number, infinity. There is no biggest number. There is only all possibility. And numbers are the digital level of this reality. And because of that, numbers represent vibrational states. As a result of that, you can manipulate reality through numbers and numerology. Because you're manipulating that level of the decoded construct. So what does all this mean? We live a false identity. We think we're humans when we're consciousness. We're multi-leveled awareness. Not just the body, consciousness. And uh, some near-death experiences have experienced and then come back to tell the story of what um, they've experienced when they've been through, sometimes they experience it as a tunnel, and then come back when their body releases the consciousness for a short time. And this is one that encapsulates all of it. He said, everything from the beginning, my birth, my ancestors, my children, my wife, everything comes together simultaneously. I saw everything about me and about everyone who was around me. I saw everything they were thinking now, what they thought then, what was happening before, what was happening now. There is no time, there is no sequence of events, no such thing as limitation of distance, of period, of time, of place. I could be anywhere I wanted to be simultaneously. This body computer is what gives us the delusion of all those things. And I'll just finish on this bit. Key to holding us in servitude is to keep us in the left hemisphere of the brain. We have two, the right brain, the left brain, and we have a bridge called the corpus callosum, which bridges the two and should pass information between the two. And the right brain, they are very, very different uh, states of being. The right brain is the out there, the creative, the connection with all that is. The left brain is what deals in numbers, in language, in sequence, and puts everything in hierarchical structures and all the rest of it. And what the system wants, is wants us in there. Because when we're in there and not in there, we are there. And the whole system is structured to put us there. The education system, everything. I found this, different functions of the right and left brain. What the right brain uh, wants to do is say the color. What the left brain wants to do, language, it wants to say the word. And it's interesting when you try to go through these and say the color, how difficult it is for many people to say the color instead of the word, to say green instead of what the left brain wants, which is yellow. And the functions of the two are massively different. This lady, um, a brain scientist, neuroanatomist called Jill Balty Taylor, became well known when she had a stroke in the 1990s, I think it was. And she had a stroke in the left brain and stayed awake for most of it, and therefore experienced what was happening. First of all, she got onto an exercise bike trying to overcome how she was feeling, and she looked down at her hands, because this left brain decoding system's now not working, and was not decoding reality as it normally did. She looked down, and she saw not hands, she saw claws. As this went on, she could no longer see a division between her 
and anything else. Everything just joined as one infinite field of energy consciousness. And she said it was just bliss. Nirvana, she called it. When she tries, eventually, the left brain eventually kicks in and says, you've got to get help. She tries to call work, a colleague, to help her out. Took her 45 minutes, I think she said, a long time, trying to go through these business cards to find the number, because when she looked at them, she couldn't see numbers and words anymore, because this wasn't decoding reality, as it should. She could see pixels. She was seeing this reality one step back in its digital pixel state. Eventually, through following the squiggles, she says, she managed to ring the number. And when the guy, he must have said something on the other end, like, hello, all she heard, she said, when he picked the phone up was, woof, 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 woof. And then she said, I, I tried to say to him, um, hey, this is Jill, I'm in trouble. And all she heard herself say was, woof, 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 woof because the vibration was not being decoded by the left brain, the language part, into words that we can um, understand. And what the system wants to do is to put these firewalls up called education, science, uh, politics, media, peer pressure, to keep the right brain out of it. And this is fundamental. Because uh, these things are all part of the defense mechanism, keeping us in left brain reality and out of right brain infinity. Now, some people, they call them um, autistic savants, like this man, Stephen Wilshire. They access the right brain potential in ways that other people don't. And this is why they're capable of fantastic achievements. This guy, Stephen Wiltshire, was taken up in a helicopter over London by the BBC for half an hour with nothing except his eyes and then came down and drew London from the air with incredible um, accuracy. Why? Because he was accessing that infinite potential that left brain people, most of people in the world don't. This guy, Daniel Tammet, another autistic savant, has, has, has again achieved incredible things because um, he was challenged once to learn Icelandic in a week and it's an incredibly difficult language to learn. I mean, none of the media were, dis were, were using on their news reading, uh, were using the real name of that volcano in Iceland, were, were they? Because they could bloody pronounce it. This guy went back on television a week later speaking Icelandic. And his Icelandic teacher said, he's not human. Yes, he is. It's the human that we once were and will be again. When this suppression of our potential and our infinite possibility is brought to an end and this shite stops. We worship the intellect. Oh, he's got a great mind. Oh, he did this at Oxford. Oh, he's gone to Harvard. Mind is such a low level of awareness. It's supposed to be a vehicle for experiencing this reality, a servant of consciousness. It's become our master. It's become something to worship. And that's the isolated intellect. That's the isolated intellect. And so we reach a point this fork in the road is, are we going to be consciousness or mind? Are we going to be all that is or little me? It's not really free your mind. It's free yourself from mind. That's why society is structured to completely engross us and swamp us in things to occupy our mind. Open your mind. Become all that is. Infinite love is the only truth, everything else is illusion. What is infinite love? All possibility. Infinite possibility. Choice between the head, thinking, intellect, and the heart, knowing wider consciousness. Then we start to access this 
wider information and see the world from a completely different level. We then start to access, once we get out of mind, all these other realities that are there to be accessed and perceived and to glean insight and information from that have been denied by being encloseted and enclosed in mind. As William Blake said, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. The control system's game is not to have that cleanse happen. René Descartes, the French uh, mathematician and philosopher, defining who we are, said, I think, therefore I am. I would update that on the body computer level and say, I compute, therefore I am. But beyond that, in the realms of consciousness, it is simply, I am, therefore I am. I am all that is, has been, and ever will be. And this multi-level conspiracy is there to keep that knowledge from us, to hold us in little me mental states, so a tiny few can control billions. Without this knowledge, we cannot understand the conspiracy and how it works. And the question is, who's behind it? See, they're hiding already. Who's behind it? And that's what we'll get to in the next section, which will start in uh, 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. This next section takes us from that information about reality and starts to relate it to the situation we find ourselves in. There are 20 years between these two photographs, and in that time, really amazing things have happened. So many people have gone from that to that, and it's an exponential curve that's gathering pace all the time. And people are starting to see what is increasingly there, that we are watching the unfolding imposition of a fascist global state, or communist global state. They're the same in either, either way. I'm sure people in fascist Germany and people in Stalinist uh, Russia thought there was a big difference between the worlds that they lived in. Different names for the same basic control system. But I would suggest that if we stay only at the level of the five senses, only at the level of the world we see banking scams, manipulated wars, Orwellian imposition, then we're not going to get truly what is going on. Because I say this, look at it. This world has been changing and is changing so rapidly in terms of all different aspects of this control system, the way they manipulate education, manipulate wars, put in the people they want as presidents, give us all this shite through food and drink, control the media, manufacture the global warming scam, Big Pharma, and 9-11 and all that stuff. And it's coming in in a, such a coordinated way. So if we are going to uh, think that this situation that we're seeing unfold goes back to a few men and women in dark suits or whatever sitting around a table saying what's our next move we are clearly massively missing the point and the vast majority of people who over the last few years have started investigating this they will not go any further they will not go any further because A, their belief systems won't let them, often their religious belief system, but also they are fearing what other people will think about them if they go into some of these areas I'm going to go into now. What people make of it is up to them. My right to say it is up to me. So yes, it's not just people sitting around a table somewhere in the world discussing the next move. There's the level where we see this unfolding in the news and, and what have you. Then there's this other dimensional, non-human level to look at, as I will in this section. Then there's the level of the nature of reality, which I've introduced already. And then there's this whole stuff about the moon, which I'll get into in this section too. And the rabbit hole doesn't end there. It goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And the deeper you go into the rabbit hole, the more we understand 
what the game is, the more we can change the game. And it's all about the control and programming of perception. That's the only way the few, and it is a few, compared with the global population, that the billions can be controlled. Manipulating how we interact with reality, keeping from us that we are consciousness, putting us in these bubbles of our sense of limitation, and I can't. Manipulating the way we decode reality, and therefore making us see the world as the control system wants us to see it. That's the basis of all of it going through the day, because that's the basis of all of it going through the whole conspiracy. So yes, of course, on one level, it does manifest as dark suits sitting around a table discussing the next move. But that's still the play out world of this conspiracy. It's not its origin. It goes beyond them into the advisors in the shadows, the Mandelsons in this country, Peter Mandelson. If he's not manipulating, it gets withdrawal symptoms, that man. And into the Rahm Emanuel's ditto in America, the controller handler of Barack Obama. It goes into deeper levels beyond them, deep in the hidden secret society network. And eventually, it goes out of this dimension. And that's where this whole thing is really coming from. Beyond the frequency range of visible light. And it involves non-human entities. Some of them people call the greys. The main ones, I would say, and have been saying for a long, long time, take a reptilian form. They operate outside. They can come into visible light. But in terms of the reptilian uh, part of this, they can't stay here for that long. So people say, why don't they just come and take over? Because they can't. Or they would. They can come for so long, but their vibrational uh, difference, incompatibility, means they have to uh, leave. They can't stay for long, although there are technological ways they can stay for longer. And they operate outside visible light, and they manipulate this reality through bloodlines, interbreeding bloodlines, that um, I'll come to. And we call them the Illuminati families. So, we operate with invisible light, but outside of that, sharing the same space, is infinite other worlds and realities. And if a so-called UFO comes into this reality, because it's coming into visible light from where we cannot decode, it just seems to appear out of flipping nowhere. Because what it's done, it hasn't actually come in, it's just changed its vibrational state to resonate with invisible light, and it's like, it came out of nowhere. And then how often do you see it? Honestly, mate, there was this bloody UFO, and it disappeared just in front of me eyes. You're, what are you on, mate? You're on the pop or what? What it's done is increased its vibrational resonance to go be out on, on visible light. Therefore, to the observer, it disappears. It not disappear at all. It's left visible light. And this range of frequency we call our world is being manipulated from vibrational frequencies beyond it. And Satanism is a network within visible light that interacts with these reptilian entities in various ways I'll get to before the end of the day. Places or areas of the heavens that come up, Orion comes up again and again in relation to these reptilians. And in terms of non-human visitations, uh, so does the Pleiades, so does in terms of the uh, reptilians, area of the heavens they call the Draco constellation, which appropriately, coming through the word derivations, brings us draconian. And of course, draconian laws are the Orwellian laws coming in. Very, very appropriate. Sirius is involved as well. So, I won't be able to get into this today, and there's a lot more to know anyway, but so is what happened to Mars. It's all involved in this story, how it became the devastated place it was, but it is, but wasn't before. And when I talk about these areas of the heavens, I'm not necessarily talking about those places with invisible light. Because just as we are multidimensional, so planets and stars, etc., are multidimensional. And just as a planet might be devastated within visible light, it's not necessarily devastated on other vibrational frequency levels of itself. Because the Earth, too, operates in visible light, but also multi levels, like everything else. Another major part of this story is that when these reptilian entities started intervening, they manipulated human genetics through interbreeding, not necessarily physical interbreeding, interbreeding through 
technological methods, and also changing human form by changing the messages, the information, I'll come to this before we finish this section, that the DNA is picking up. And through that, you can change a form by changing the um, information the DNA is picking up. And it's no accident that humans have massive fundamental reptilian genetics. This part of the brain, which uh, scientists call the R-complex or the reptilian brain, will be very, very important as we go through this second part of the day because it's fundamental to how human behavior and human perception is manipulated to see the world as we currently see it. This interbreeding is talked about and recorded all across the world in the ancient accounts. Of course, I guess because it's the Bible, the best known is this section from Genesis. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were the old men of renown. But that's just the biblical version. <coughs> Got a frog in my throat, the reptilian going. <laughs> um, all across the ancient world, you see similar stories and accounts of this interbreeding. Something else goes parallel with the reptilian story. Again, not just in the Bible with the Garden of Eden and all that stuff, which of course the serpent was dominant, but across the ancient accounts. And that is the connection between the reptilian intervention <clears throat> and what we call the fall of man. And again, this is universal. And these themes will come together again and again as we go through this next part. The ancient accounts, again, we're talking that part of the Yuga cycle, which they call the Golden Age, talk about the fact that there was a time when humans were so unbelievably different to how we are today. They were connected to higher, higher levels of consciousness. They were in this world, but they were certainly not of it. They were capable of incredible feats and they lived what we would call impossible lengths of time in terms of age. And then there was a sudden change, the fall of man, as it was called. What I call this is the schism. There was an energetic schism at the level of the metaphysical universe, the waveform base information construct, and that as it was decoded through into this holographic reality, obviously mirrored in the holographic play-out world, the schism in the information construct. And this is a portrayal of that, a symbolic portrayal of that. Anything that happens here gets decoded through to there, and this is where the schism happened. It was like a distortion in the information. Thanks, mate. Cheers. You put the gin in, right? It was a distortion in the base information construct, and I'll be coming to uh, how that happened. There were many consequences for this, and one of them was it wasn't just a schism in the energetic uh, level of, and, uh, of the world itself. There was a schism was passed through into human personalities. We became distorted also from the magnificence and harmony that we were before. And we went from that to this. And we're now at the point where we're coming out of that. And there was also genetic manipulation to stop us accessing ranges of frequency that we did before. This is a major reason, not the only reason, but it is a major reason why scientists call 95% of human DNA junk DNA because they don't know what it does. This is the reason, not the only reason, but a major reason why we only use a fraction of our brain's capacity. This is why billions of cells in that bridge, the corpus callosum, don't seem to be doing anything. They've been switched off. We've been put into a state that disconnects us and therefore makes us controllable, makes us farmable. 
So you've got this reptilian group, and the ones involved appear to be relatively small in number, tiny compared with the global population, and this is why they're terrified of being exposed. That's a constant, constant theme, all the way through it, wherever you look. And they've imprisoned humanity, or sought to, in this tiny, tiny frequency range of perception called visible light. Another key aspect to this is that they created hybrid bloodlines specifically to be the middle men and women. They became known in the ancient world as the demigods, the people, the children of the gods, part human, part god, as these serpent gods were perceived. And they were to be, like I say, the middlemen of, and women operating in visible light for the outside visible light control system. And it's appropriate that the caduceus and the symbol of the medical profession is the DNA, in effect, portrayed as two snakes. Because to these reptilian geneticists, who were far, far ahead of where we are in public arena in terms of genetics and understanding, the DNA is a software program. And so they manipulate it for their own means. And this is crucial to understand the world that we live in. One seriously important aspect to this DNA, this hybrid DNA I'm talking about, is that it has eliminated what we call empathy. The ability to decode the emotion of empathy. Empathy is the fail-safe mechanism of all behavior. If I can empathize with the consequences for others of my actions, that limits my and balances my actions. If I have no empathy because I cannot empathize, then there are no limits. There is nothing that won't do. 3,000 dead on 9-11, <laughs> who cares? Who cares? That's what we're dealing with. And this is, an, this, is, this is vital to get across. If we look at this information on the basis of thinking, I wouldn't do that, so they wouldn't do it, then we're going to miss the plot completely. Because that's not like that. No, you wouldn't do it. They would and have no emotional comeback whatsoever. The reason for the interbreeding, the hybrid, is vibrational compatibility. These hybrids have a greater infusion of reptilian DNA than the general population, although we have a lot. And therefore, the resonance is sympathetic to the resonance of these entities operating just outside visible light. And through this resonant connection, like two radio stations talking to each other, the possessing entity outside of visible light can control the thoughts, actions, perceptions of the intermediary, the demigod. And of course, the theme of possession is as old as history, right up to the present day. We look at these people, all these pictures are by Neil Haig, by the way, anything that looks like this. Great, great, great friend of mine, great artist. And this image symbolizes the fact that he looks at him with invisible light and he sees George Bush, nothing else. What people don't see, because it's outside the frequency range of their decoding system, is there are um, entities around these people who are actually controlling these people's um, thoughts, actions, etc. A number of psychics have said to me around the world how they've seen people walking along the street or wherever, and then they've seen like an ethereal reptilian entity locking into these bottom two chakra points, the emotional uh, level, one of them is, and floating around with them. And this is a, a, a kind of a good analogy. You know when uh, there's scientists in a laboratory and they're trying to work with something that they can't touch because it's too dangerous? What they're working with will be in a tank, and they'll put gloves on, which allows them to be outside the tank, but to, to manipulate inside the tank. Well, that is a very good symbol of what I'm talking about. These Illuminati bloodlines, these hybrid bloodlines, operate like those gloves, operating inside this reality. And Neil symbolizes these Illuminati families with invisible light as this bearded man. Whenever you see him, as we go along, that is symbolic of the Illuminati families, controlled beyond human sight by these reptilian entities. When the world started to 
recover from great geological catastrophes, which I'll come to in a second, there were areas of the world that stood out in terms of their abilities and potentials and advancement. These were some of them. And this area is particularly important to the bloodlines I'm talking about. The area that was once called Sumer, thousands of years BC, and became Babylon. This is why Babylon comes up in the writings of these people uh, so often. And it's Mesopotamia, the land between two rivers. They didn't invade Iraq just for oil or just for anything. They didn't invade it for one thing, but multiple things. But one reason they're so obsessed with Iraq is because to these bloodlines in control of the world today, this is a very significant, almost religious piece of land of historical importance to them. As Sumer and Babylon broke up, these bloodlines started going walkabout. They became the royal families of the world. And what do royal families claim? The right to rule because of the divine right to rule. The Chinese emperors used to claim the right to be emperor because of their genetic connection to the serpent gods. And this is a theme all the way across the world between the serpent gods and royalty. They became the aristocracy and the royal families claiming the right to rule because of their DNA. Just down the bloody road from here, we have a head of state in Britain to this day who is only head of state because of her DNA. Head of state because of her DNA. I actually uh, made a complaint, nothing happened to it, but I made a complaint to the uh, Race Relations Commission or whatever they call it. They said, if you see racism, report it. So I reported the royal family. I thought, well, I mean, well, you would. You would, because they, they go, racism, we must stop racism. All these bloody politicians go, well, get down to Buckingham Palace then. You're saying you can only be head of state, not only if you're bloody white effectively, but if you only come from the same bloody family. Ridiculous. Anyway, it's always been and it still is. And so these uh, aristocratic and royal families moved on. Eventually, when the people started to rebel against overt royal control dictatorship, these families, some of them stayed in the royal families overtly, and there's still some around, like ours. But these families moved into politics, into banking, into business, and became the dark suit, so, but they still perceived themselves as royalty, as special because of this genetic connection to the serpent gods. And through the, great, the British Empire, the so-called Great British Empire, and the other European empires, as these uh, bloodlines moved up into Europe from the Middle East, etc., they exported these bloodlines all over the world. And we saw them in power in what we call colonization. But there's two types of control. One has a finite life, one can go on forever until it's exposed. The one that has a finite life is a dictatorship that the people under dictatorship can see, touch and taste. Communism, fascism, apartheid. People know where they stand and eventually, therefore, they will rebel against it because they know what they're dealing with. The greatest form of control is a control you can't see. Prison without the bars. You can't see the bars because you'll just sit there. People do not rebel against not being free when they think they are. And that's the idea um, of replacing the colony control with another kind of control called freedom. So what happened is as these um, colonies, like, like the United States as it became, etc., and all the others around the world, as they were given independence, what was left out in those countries were the bloodline, under different names, the secret society network that manipulates the bloodline agenda, and those countries have gone on being controlled ever since. But because they have the ability to have a vote every four or five years, they don't realize they live in a tyranny. And that's how it works, the prison without the bars. And until it's exposed, it'll go on forever. And so these kind of people, especially the Rothschilds, they are major, major players in this. They are the middlemen for the manipulation of this reality from these entities mostly outside of this reality. And what they've created is like a global transnational corporation. What you have with a corporation is you have a headquarters somewhere in the world, and then in each country you have subsidiary companies of that headquarters, that central point. And all the subsidiaries in the world carry out the policy of the central point. 
Well, what these Illuminati hybrid family networks have done is create exactly the same, but instead of companies, they are secret society networks. So you've got the center of the web in Europe, for historical reasons, uh, at operational level anyway, people at places like London, not the British government, the secret society center in London, in um, Rome is another one, the Roman church, Rome and, and other points in Europe. And then in each country, you have families from the network in those countries whose job it is, is to run the networks that control that country's business, banking, politics, media, all of it. And so what you have is from this central point in Europe, the center of the web, all these different places and countries all over the world then impose on their country what is being dictated here. And that's why as I travel around the world, I see the same things being introduced in different countries at the same time, overwhelmingly justified by the same excuses. It's all a global uh, network. It can be symbolized too as a, a web, like I say, with the Rothschilds real close to the spider and all these different strands on the web are different secret societies, different semi-secret societies, transnational corporations, and all the rest of it. So when you see all these different names of these corporations that dominate uh, the world in so many ways, and the pharmaceutical cartel, and the oil cartel, and all the rest of it, the biotech cartel, they're all different names or different masks on the same one face. And so you have this structure where Outside of visible light, you have the reptilian control system comes down through the Illuminati families and they control the people in power to push the world in a certain direction. Another way of looking at it here. You see, all these different people, these, these fight among themselves and all the rest of it, though if it gets out of hand, they get sorted. So these sit on the top of all these different countries. They control these different um, areas of their societies and the people um, are then played off against each other. These buggers don't go to war, they tell these buggers to go to war. And if we stop going to bloody war, game over. But we do. Ridiculous. That's part of becoming conscious. <laughs> so these people are just pawns in a game in a way, genetic pawns in a game. They're just kind of shells to play out this agenda with invisible light. I mean, some batches are better than others, of course. So if you look at the, the principle of the Trojan horse, the symbol of the Trojan horse, coming into a society and not seeming to be what it is, though taking it over, and you put that on the face, well, you've pretty much got symbolically what we're talking about here. People send me uh, pictures from around the world and stuff uh, that they find on the internet and elsewhere, which have a kind of reptilian feel about them. I'm not saying these are reptilian eyes, it could be a trick of the light, but I've used it because it gives an indication of the number of people that have told me this all around the world, from all walks of life, how they've seen people shift in, from a human to a reptilian state, and especially the eyes, the eyes are the, the first to go. They, they describe how the pupils become reptilian. And interestingly, a great friend of mine has uh, an associate who, I don't agree with it, but he's been doing a, a research project to develop iris scan technology, and it led to him looking very deeply into 2,300 eyes and he said he knew nothing about what I'm saying, probably never heard of me. Um, and he, he said to my friend, it was, the amazing thing was that about 4% appeared to be of reptilian type and appearance. And that is a, a recurring number, in my research anyway, 4, 5% seem to be of this hybrid nature. So these people are reptilian hybrid human reptilians. And you, you look at the eyes, but behind the eyes are something else. I had an experience with this guy, Ted Heath. He was Prime Minister of Britain from 1970 to 74, took us into the European Union as it became. And I, it's a long story, I've told it before, but he, he looked at me um, in a dressing room in a television station. And as he looked at me, this is what his eyes did. His eyes went completely black, everything. And as I looked into his eyes, it must have been like that for, I don't know, maybe a minute, two minutes. And as I looked into his eyes, I said at the time, it was like looking into two black holes because you couldn't make eye contact because there was no contact. And I, I, it was like, as I know now, looking through him 
into this other dimension where he was really controlled from. This man, Ted Heath, oh my goodness me. My goodness me, the children, that guy has tortured and killed. And I've been saying this since 1998 in print, and he was alive for many, 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 many years after that. And nothing happened. Why? Because it's true. And so these people are like hiding behind human form. And hey, I rest my case. I rest my case. <laughs> Ooh, you look tasty. And this lack of empathy in this hybrid DNA explains why these guys do what they do. Now, when you open your mind, instead of saying, well, it's not possible, it's ridiculous, when you open your mind and say, okay, I'm not going to just accept this stuff, I'm, but I'm going to flow with it and see where it goes, you find that this stuff I'm talking about is absolutely in your face when you bring it from the subliminal to the conscious. The oldest form of religious worship in, in the world has been taken back 70,000 years uh, to an area of the Kalahari Desert in South Africa, and it is worship of the serpent or worship of the snake. This man, Reverend John Bathurst Dean, uh, wrote a book, very, very good book, 1933, called Worship of the Serpent, in which he studied serpent worship around the world. This was his conclusion. It appears then that no nations were so geographically remote or so religiously discordant, but that one and only one so superstitious characteristic was common to all, that the most civilized and the most barbarous bowed down with the same devotion to the same engrossing deity, and that this deity either was or was represented by the same sacred serpent. It appears also that in most, if not all, the civilized countries where this serpent was worshipped, some fable or tradition which involved its history, directly or indirectly, alluded to the fall of man in paradise, in which the serpent was concerned. What follows then, but that the most ancient account respecting the cause and nature of this seduction must be the one from which all the rest are derived, which represent the victorious serpent, victorious over man in a state of innocence and subduing his soul in a state of sin, as he would call it as a reverend, into the most abject veneration and adoration of himself. Like I say, wherever you go, it comes up. You find obvious representations of the serpent gods. These were found in graves of the Ubaid people that preceded Sumer in what we now call Iraq. These were the Nagas, the shape-shifting reptilian uh, people of Asia. The Druids used to worship a serpent god called Hugh. And if you play that word through, Hugh man becomes serpent man appropriately. The Egyptians used to worship serpent gods and represent their pharaohs as a result of that in this way. You had the cobra coming, coming from the, uh, the headdress there. You had the cobra head uh, gear itself representing the snake. You had the belly of the cobra. The cobra is a, a constant common symbol of this serpent race. In Central America, you had Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent god, and the Mayan version of it was Kukulkan, um, in places like Chichen Itza. Uh, of course, right across Asia, Japan, China, etc., the very most dominant symbol of that part of the world is the dragon, which comes from this worship of the serpent gods. Folklore is full of serpent uh, stories and, and, and what have you. When I first met Credo Mutwa, a long time ago now, he contacted me when I was going around South Africa, this Zulu shaman, the official historian of the Zulu nation, uh, because he'd read in a book called The Biggest Secret that I'd introduced this reptilian stuff for the first time. And he said, Mr. David, how do you know? How do you know about the Chittahuri? And I didn't know about the Chittahuri, tell me. And he told me the story of African history where the Chittahuri, which translates as children of the serpent or children of the python, had taken over the world in the very same way that other parts of the ancient world described it. This is a painting that he did of one type of this Chittahuri from ancient and modern accounts. And he showed me this called the Necklace of the Mysteries. It says a necklace, it's very, very heavy, copper, and it goes on your shoulders. How he keeps it on his shoulders, I'll never know, it's so heavy. And he uses it as the historian of the Zulu nation, the symbols hanging from it, to tell the story of Africa and the world in general. And Pride of Place 
on the front is a non-human entity with a, a willy in come and get me mode and a human woman. And I said to him, what's all that about? And he said, this is uh, symbolic of the interbreeding of the Chittahuri and humans to create these hybrid bloodlines, these children of the serpent. And then I asked him, oh, by the way, that's uh, copper now, but in the original, and this necklace of the mysteries, by the way, is mentioned in accounts 500 years old, and Credo reckons it's about 1,000 years old, and it has a flying saucer on it, very clearly, uh, a flying saucer hanging from it, which the storytelling says that's where, how the Chittahuri came here. Anyway, this is copper now, but it used to be gold. Someone stole it, and they couldn't afford to put gold back, and that takes us to North Africa and Egypt, and the the, the base story of the Egyptian myths, and that's the golden penis of Osiris, which all relates into this golden bloodline, this special bloodline. And when I said to Credo, what, what, why is it um, not reptilian? He said, because the Chittahuri, and this is the theme I've found all over the place, the Chittahuri said, you must not portray us as we really are. Some people did, most people didn't. They had to do it symbolically. So they made it absolutely, obviously not human, but not reptilian for fear of the consequences. And when I was writing uh, the new book, uh, Human Race, Get Off Your Knees, I came across um, a work in progress, I think it's finished now, by um, a man called Pierre Sabak. And he was producing a book called The Murder of Reality. And Pierre Sabak spent seven years nearly pouring through dictionaries. He's crazy about words and derivatives pouring through dictionaries and, and what have you, all these different peoples and different languages and different eras. And he put together the fact that the language, the very language, if you follow the derivatives back from the language we use now and their origins, where the words came from, tell the story of this reptilian serpent god race taking over um, humanity and also how they used to symbolize this race for reasons I've just said, not as they really were, but as uh, eagles, as hawks, as owls, as angels. If you take the word angel back to its origin in Sabak's research, you get a word meaning snake or serpent. And so we have the eagle on so many countries' um, flags and logos, including the United States most famously. You have the owls uh, invariably with the, the goddess of Babylon, Semiramis or Ishtar. You have the story of the angels, especially the um, theme of the fallen angels, representing this reptilian uh, race and interbreeding with humanity. And you have Horus, the son of God of uh, Egypt, the virgin-born son, represented as a hawk, again with the uh, reptilian um, imagery. This uh, seraphim, one of the hierarchy of angels in Christian and um, Hebrew uh, Jewish belief, seraphim word means snake or serpent, if you take it back to its origin. You have the, the flying serpent disc, which is widely used in the ancient world. And another thing that they did was they symbolized the heavens as the upper ocean. We have the ocean that we have, obviously, and then you had the upper ocean, which was the heavens. And so they talked about the gods and the serpent gods coming in their heavenly boats through the upper ocean. And so you have a lot of marine symbolism which doesn't relate to the sea it relates to the upper ocean and it's reading this these bloodlines were known in the ancient world under different symbols and different codes like children from heaven and earth and um, children of the gods children of the sky and another big symbol of these um, gods these serpent gods were the watchers they were called the watchers this is widely widely found and that's why there's an eye as Credo Mutwa confirmed on that hand on the Necklace of the Mysteries, that's the watchers, that's the serpent gods. And that's why we have the eye on top of the pyramid, the all-seeing eye on the dollar bill, and why that is a massive Illuminati symbol in the secret society network. They are the gods overseeing the pyramid of control. One way uh, that they often symbolize these hybrid bloodlines in the ancient world was as part human down, down to the bottom of the torso and then the legs or the bottom part being a snake. You come across this a great deal when you research this stuff. This is all symbolic of this half human, half snake symbolism. Over and over and over again you see it. And the, the cobra, like I say, is very much uh, a common symbol of these serpent gods, as is fighting the serpent gods and battles with them. 
Even uh, the word Messiah comes from Mesa, the Nile crocodile, which they use the oil from the Nile crocodile to anoint the pharaohs. And even today in the British coronation um, ceremony, they symbolize that as part of our own ceremony appropriately. Um, in the Bible, the devil is symbolized or described in reptilian terms. The old serpent called the devil and Satan who deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Fallen angels, again, the recurring theme. All these folk tales about uh, kissing frogs and turning into princes and uh, invariably uh, you get reptilian themes, all part of the same story. And people send me images from all over the world as a result of the information I've put out. It's amazing how many times you see the symbol of reptile and humans, or part human, part reptile, or overseeing the gargoyles in the, the palaces and castles and churches of this elite are symbolic of that. And of course, over the last, oh, I don't know, 20 years or so, there's been a mass of reptilian symbolism in children's stories and children's entertainment. And then recently, I mean, you saw this, it's a quick one, they, this 16th century painting in the National Portrait Gallery of Queen Elizabeth I, they thought she was holding flowers because that's what someone had painted over. But with where, um, what's underneath is coming to light. And this is a representation of it. It was in one of the papers. Again, holding the snake, very, very appropriate. And these um, aristocratic families, which became the hybrids, again, used reptilian dragon and all these other serpent images on their various coats of arms and what have you. And one of the centers, like I said earlier, is London. Not Lo necessarily London, the great conurbation, but the city of London and the temple that runs into the city of London. The city of London, of course, being the great center of not just British finance, but global finance. And how appropriate that they, too, have the symbol of the flying dragon and the symbol of the Knights Templar Secret Society, a major strand in this web of secret societies, as the very symbol of the city of London. You pass these as you go into the city, of course. Another theme you find with images around the world is of serpents eating humans. And not nice, it isn't, of course, but they do eat humans. When these um, reptilians uh, come into visible light, they use humans as their food, like humans use animals, cattle, sheep. And then um, you'll see the recurring theme all over the world. This is in Central America, the Mayan area. This is uh, a painting by uh, Credo Muchwa from uh, South African myths of the serpent gods, the Chitahuri eating humans. And this is Alfa Romeo. What's he doing there? What's he bloody doing there? Same thing. And in uh, the garden of one of the palaces, or whatever you call them, mansions of Silvio Berlusconi in Italy, the leader and one of the world's most corrupt men, is again the same image. And outside of visible light, they feed off human energy, human emotion, especially, well, only low vibrational emotion, because that's all they can really access. And so they have to keep humans in a state of mental and emotional suppression so that we keep uh, feeding out this energy which they then absorb and um, that will become relevant in the, the next section when I get into why pedophilia is so widespread among this elite because um, energy changes with the emotions we give out when we give out love it's a certain wavelength when we give out hate it's a very different wavelength and uh, the friend of mine in, um, in, in Japan has became very well known for taking water, name's Mr. Emoto, taking water, putting it in um, a container, and then he'll put words of love or hate or whatever on the side of it, because when you write a word, that word may seem in the decoded realm as a word you can see and read, but in the vibrational realm, it represents a vibration. If you could see the vibration of, of writing the word hate to the word, writing the word love, it would be dramatic. In fact, you're looking at it. Because what happens is, he, after he's put the word um, on the side of the water, he then freezes the water really, really fast. I've seen his laboratory where he does it. And then he photographs the crystals. This is the crystal from a water that had love and appreciation written on it. This is the crystal that had hate written on the side of the water. And he's done whole books about, about this stuff with all these pictures in it. And this is the energy that these entities absorb when they're outside of visible light, which is most of the time. 
and therefore they have to keep us in a state that keeps producing that. All this vampire stuff, because they drink human blood with invisible light because it carries the human genetic code and allows them to hold their vibrational compatibility with this reality for longer before they have to get the hell out of it. That's why they drink so much blood. And then there's this thing about um, shape-shifting, where you know, I've had a lot of you know, laughter and ridicule, so what's bloody new about this? And people say, um, well, you, you can't go from a solid body to a solid body and back again. And I'm saying, do you know? I agree with you. Of course you can't. But that's not what's happening, because there is no solid body. It's all happening as a decoding system. There is no solidity. So what shape-shifting is, is you have a situation like this, and the, f the, f the front f dominating from our perception of, of, of observation energy field is the human one. So we look at George Bush or somebody, and we see a human. But sometimes, especially at times of high emotion, this shift can happen where the reptilian field comes forward. And as it does so, becomes the dominant one, often briefly, the observer now starts decoding that. And then it shifts back, and you start decoding this. And to, to the observer decoding that shift, creating the holographic reality in their head, which is where everything happens, to their observation, someone's gone from a human to a reptilian, and then back to human again. It's not, of course, shifting solidity. She's a hologram like... We're all holograms, and they can shift. This is where shape-shifting happens, what we call physical shape-shifting, illusory, in our heads. So the road to tyranny began when these reptilians arrived. Before that, like I say, the world was very different. The golden age, the time when humans were just extraordinary before the suppression. And then came this energetic schism, this distortion in the information construct which got played out into the holographic world as m on one level as massive geological events with volcanoes and, and, and storms and, and what have you and of course symbolized by Noah and the great flood though there have been many of these not just one um, and Noah is simply a biblical version of much much older stories that tell exactly the same story of how the earth turned over, how there was a massive uh, flood, tidal waves, what we call today as tsunamis, how there were great geological catastrophes and upheavals, and basically the world was, certainly the society that went before, was destroyed. It was a blank sheet of paper. And in this distortion, humans lost the power of the connection they had to higher levels of awareness. And this happened. We went from being part of the field, knowingly so, and to being taken over and suppressed by this reptilian race. Because once the blank sheet of paper was created by the geological catastrophe, and why that happened I'll come to not very long from now, the earth um, started to settle down. And when it settled down, then everything started to be rebuilt, but in a very, very different, much lower level than it was before. And there was the genetic manipulation too. And in China, unlike most other countries, you can't access vast tracts of the internet because the computer system has been firewalled off to stop Chinese people accessing that area of the internet that the authorities don't want them to see. What happened as a part of this intervention, I kind of hit, uh, mentioned it a little earlier, is that human genetics were manipulated to do exactly the same to us, to firewall off us from the level of reality that we could access before. So we went into this prison called Visible Light that we've been in ever since, and particularly isolated in the left side of the brain so that we only perceive through the five senses and we can only see structure and language and a hierarchy and all that stuff and our potential dramatically, dramatically reduced. And this world came as a result of it. And it's dominated 
by controlling human perception, by suppressing our true self and dictating what we uh, bring into holographic reality. Okay, now let's go really crazy. I've had enough of only being half crazy. Let's do the bloody lot, eh? <laughs> what I want to say before I go into this is this. One of the most profound ways that people are controlled is to limit their sense of possibility. It, your sense of possibility becomes your sense of what is possible. Now, that's an obvious thing, and it's a truism, but often we miss what's in front of our eyes. In other words, if you can program a sense of what's possible and make it narrow and incredibly limited, then when people come along and say, this is going on, these people say, you're bloody mad. That's not possible, is it? No, you don't believe it's possible. Talking to some of the ins insiders that I have over the years uh, and, and talking to other people who've done the same, they, there is a, a feeling among some of them that these entities technologically, and I, I keep emphasizing, there's not that many of them compared with humans and so therefore they, um, they have to keep out of sight and that's one of the reasons, the major reason they want to cull the global population because it's out of hand from their point of view. Um, or stick around, it's going to be out of hand a bit more <laughs> very soon. Um, but they reckon, some of them, that this technology that these people are working with, these entities are working with, is like 10,000 years ahead of where we are. But t it, that's a bit of a misnomer because there's, there's a line, like a Rubicon, of awareness of how reality works. And when you're this side of it, you are in a state of tremendous limitation. But once you cross it, and, and you, by, by realizing the nature of reality that I've been talking about today, suddenly you can move very fast in terms of um, your ability and your potential and all the rest of it. But while we're here, they reckon we're there about 10,000 years ahead. Um, so we're dealing not with what we can do, but with what very advanced technological entities will do. Not spiritually advanced, intellectually, technologically advanced. What happened was that I was writing this latest book and I sat down one morning. I've had one or two thoughts about this before, but they've come and gone. But I sat down one morning at the computer to start writing. And it was like, I've had this so many times in my life in the last 20 years. It was like an energy field descends upon me and suddenly I just knew the moon was not what it seems to be. It wasn't the heavenly body, the natural phenomenon that we believe that it is. And from that moment, information started to come to me in the five sense world, uh, pointing to exactly that. Again, we come back to that line 20 years ago, knowledge will be put into his mind and at other times he will be led to knowledge. This combination has been constantly repeating and it gets more and more powerful. First I get an insight, I know where the, the moon's not real, where, where, where's that come from? And then suddenly it starts. I went on the internet, and within two, three minutes, I was expecting to find nothing. I just put on a few words indicating the, 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 the moon's not real in, the, in the, the, sen the sense that we think it is. And bingo, within two, two, three minutes or less, I'd found this book, Who Built the Moon? by two researchers who written other books. Um, one of them an investigation into Freemasonry. And this book um, details the extraordinary anomalies relating to the moon. And they came to the conclusion, and I absolutely bloody agree with them, and, and, and a bit more than, than that too, as I'll come to later, that this is the, what we're looking at. Um, the, the, the geometrical connections and everything, and, and the uh, mathematics and the relationship between them in terms of size and position is just mind-blowing. And what I'm suggesting, and I, I'm not alone over the years, uh, at this level of it, though I think I might be alone at the next bit, and I'll come to in a second or a few minutes. Um, <laughs> I've been there before, I don't mind. Um, is that the moon is actually a hollowed out planetoid by a very, very advanced uh, race, and it was brought here to t take the Earth over. And what they do, this seems to be a modus operandi. They bring these moons in, and as they bring them in, they fundamentally affect the earth. I mean, the earth is at the spin it is and is at the angle it is because of the moon. 
a lot, massively so anyway, to, because of the moon. So when they come in, bingo, um, things change, and the society that was there before ain't there anymore. And then gradually they take them over in ways that I'll, I'll come to. Um, so when the moon came in, and again, it's so important to come back from the holographic world to the base construct. We see a, a solid moon, yes, in the play out world. But back here, it is an energetic construct in the metaphysical universe. And as it came in, it cre and, and other things that happened, which I talk about in the book, it created this distortion in the information construct of the waveform information uh, base of this universe. And as it did so, it was played out here in all this catastrophe and stuff that I talked about and the ancients talk about. Um, it was played out as this great geological catastrophe and, and, and the great flood and all the rest of it. And what is a common theme that they talk about, the ancients, in, in, in relation to this? The earth turned over. And you think, how the freaking hell can the earth turn over? Well, well, what happened? What, what, what happened when the moon came in, the earth turned over? It's at an angle that it is today because of the moon. And so, the distortion brought an end to the world that was there before, and we went, basically went back to rubbing sticks together because of what happened. And that distortion was played out in the human mind, the human perception, the human psyche, and we completely changed our perception of the world and who we are, where we are. So in Who Built the Moon, like I say, I do recommend it, um, the way it looks at um, the anomalies and everything, and the connections um, between these three bodies. And these mathematical, um, geometrical um, connections only apply to these three bodies in the solar system. They don't play out against the other planets, ju and, uh, just these three. And the, the moon is so perfectly positioned that because of where it is, when we have an eclipse, it is the same size as the sun. That's why we have the eclipse. And the authors of Who Built the Moon say this, the moon is bigger than it should be, apparently older than it should be, and much lighter in mass than it should be. It occupies an unlikely orbit and is so extraordinary that all existing explanations for its presence are fraught with difficulties, and none of them could cons be considered remotely watertight. When, when you go on and you say, where'd the moon come from, you get this story. And like so much in what we call science, that people take it as fact, it's actually a theory which repeated becomes fact. But then you go back and you find that it's a theory. And the first one is the moon was created by what's known as the whack theory or the big whack theory. And that is that a Mars-type planet came in, smacked the Earth, great chunk came off and became the moon. When the physics of that didn't work out, they came up with the double whack theory where the Mars-type planet hit the Earth, bit comes off or whatever, and then the Mars-type planet thinks, well, I'll give him I'll give him one with the right, I'll give you one with the left, comes back and whacks it again, the old one too. Talk about bloody desperate. And the truth is, and, and, and honest scientists will tell you, they have no bloody clue where the moon come from, and it shouldn't, by physics, be there. This guy, um, Isaac Asmanov, a Russian professor of biochemistry, did a lot of writing on, on, on this sort of stuff. And he said this, quite rightly, we cannot help but come to the conclusion that the moon by rights ought not to be there. The fact that it is, is one of those strokes of luck almost too good to accept. Small planets such as Earth with weak gravitational fields might well lack satellites. In general then, when a planet does have satellites, those satellites are much smaller than the planet itself. Therefore, even if the Earth has a satellite, there would be every reason to suspect that at best it would be a tiny world, perhaps 30 miles in diameter. But that is not so. Earth is not only has a satellite, but it is a giant satellite, 2,160 miles in diameter. How is it then that that tiny Earth has one? Amazing. Some scientists don't even talk about a planet satellite relationship, but a planet-planet relationship. The moon's bigger than Pluto. The best explanation for the moon is observational error. The moon doesn't exist, that scientist said. Another one from NASA, it seems easier to explain the non-existence of the moon than its existence. And then we get the hollow moon. This is what I'm saying, and others have said, is that it's a hollowed-out planetoid. 
In November 1969, the moon was hit by a lunar module to the equivalent of one ton of TNT. The shock waves built up, and NASA scientists said the moon rang like a bell. Morris Ewing, a co-director of the seismic experiment, told the news conference, as for the meaning of it, I'd rather not make an interpretation right now, but it is as though someone had struck a bell, say, in the belfry of a church, a single blow, and found that the reverberation from it continued for 30 minutes. It got a bigger smack eventually, which I'll come to. Frank uh, Press from the Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology, MIT, said that for a rather small impact to produce an effect that lasted for 30 minutes was quite beyond the range of our experience. This is a, a guy called Gordon MacDonald. He said in the early 1960s, it would seem that the moon is more like a hollow than a homogeneous sphere. And this guy from MIT said the lunar orbiter experiments had vastly improved knowledge of the moon's gravitational field and indicated the frightening possibility that the moon might be hollow. Now um, we'll come to this bigger whack. Uh, a launch vehicle struck the moon with the equivalent of 11 tons of TNT, and NASA scientists said the moon reacted like a gong and continued to vibrate for three hours and 20 minutes to a depth of up to 25 miles. Um, Ken Johnson, a supervisor of the data and photo control department during the Apollo missions, told Who Built the Moon author Alan Butler that the moon not only rang like a bell, but the whole moon wobbled in such a precise way that it was almost as though it had gigantic hydraulic damper struts inside it. These two Russian scientists from the Soviet Academy of Scientists wrote an article in 1970 in Sputnik magazine in Russia headed, Is the Moon the Creation of an Alien Intelligence? And all these years later, um, it indicates to the fact that they were right. What they point out, and others point out, is the outer surface of the moon is extremely hard and contains minerals like titanium. Moon rocks have been found to contain processed metals, including brass and mica, and the elements uranium-236 and neptunium-237 that have never been found to occur naturally. Uranium-236 is a long-lived radioactive nuclear waste and is found in spent nuclear fuel and reprocessed uranium. Neptunium-237 is a radioactive metallic element and a byproduct of nuclear reactors and the production of uh, plutonium. Some lunar rocks have been found to contain 10 times more titanium than titanium-rich rocks on Earth. Titanium is used in supersonic jets, deep diving submarines, and, the, and spacecraft. Dr. Harold Urey, the uh, winner of the Nobel Prize for Chemistry, said he was terribly puzzled by the rocks from the moon, and in particular their titanium content. He said the samples were mind blowers and that he could not account for the titanium. The two Russian scientists said in their article, if a material had to be devised to protect a giant artificial satellite from the unfavorable effects of temperature from the cosmic radiation and uh, meteorite bombardment, the experts would probably have hit upon precisely these refractory metals. Refractory metals are incredibly um, uh, resistant to heat and wear. In that case, is it not clear why lunar rock is such a, an extraordinarily poor heat conductor, a factor which so amazed the astronauts? Wasn't that what the designers of this super Sputnik of the Earth were after? From the engineer's point of view, this spaceship of ages long past, which we call the moon, is superbly um, constructed. They say uh, it's a hollowed out planetoid, and they say if you're going to launch an artificial Sputnik, then it is advisable to make it hollow. At the same time, it would be naive to imagine that anyone capable of such a tremendous space project would be satisfied simply with some kind of giant empty trunk um, hurled into a uh, near-Earth uh, trajectory. It is more likely that what we have here is a very ancient spaceship, the interior of which was filled with fuel for the engines and materials and appliances for repair work, navigation instruments, observation equipment, and all manner of machinery. In other words, everything necessary to enable this caravel of the universe to serve as a Noah's Ark, appropriate, of intelligence, perhaps even as the home of a whole civilization envisaging a prolonged thousands of millions of years existence and long wanderings through space thousands of millions of miles. Naturally, the hull of such a spaceship must be super tough in order to stand up to the blows of meteorites and sharp fluctuations between extreme heat and extreme cold. Probably the shell is a double-layered affair the basis is a dark armoring of about 20 miles in thickness, and outside of it, some kind of more loosely packed covering, a thinner layer, averaging about three miles. In certain areas where the lunar seas and craters are, the upper layer is quite thin, in some cases, uh, non-existent. And as this uh, scientist said, 
the moon is made inside out. In other words, what's on the outside should really be on the inside, and that supports the idea of a hollowed out planetoid. So, when I've put, started to put this together, and there's a lot more of this in the, in the new book, I then call the oracle in South Africa, Crater Mutwa, and I found Zulu legends to be incredibly accurate with their symbolism. And, and this is the thing, symbolism. You get these um, anthropologists and people, they go around and they look at these uh, shamans and these ancient stories, and they take the blooming things literally. Now, like I said earlier, we now have the tools which make it easier for us because technology is mirroring reality, therefore we have the analogies. When these uh, ancient stories were, were put together, they didn't have that. They had to try to get their point across in simple ways that people of that time could relate to. So they used symbolism. So when I read uh, Aran Crater Mutwa, I didn't tell him anything that I'd put together or come across or thought. I just said to him, can you tell me any Zulu legends about the moon? And he said, yes, we um, consider the moon to be an egg. Now, when um, you take that literally, you say, the moon's an egg, the anthropologists, the primitive people you know. But no, they symbolize it as an egg for a reason. And this is what he said. The legends, the Zulu legends, say that the moon was brought here hundreds of generations ago by two brothers, Wawani and Umpanku, who were the leaders of the Chittahuri. They were known as the Water Brothers and had, quote, scaly skin like a fish. Now, this story relates almost exactly to the stories found on ancient clay tablets in what is now Iraq, Sumer, Sumerian accounts of the Anunnaki, a non-human race, I would say reptilian race, that came to the earth in the same way that um, uh, other parts of the, uh, the world, in the ancient world, talk about. And the Anunnaki, according to these accounts, were led by two brothers called Enki and Enlil. And at least one of them, um, Enki, was symbolized under another name too as a, a relation, in relation to water, exactly the same as this. Zulu legends tell of how Wawani and Mpanku stole the moon in the form of an egg, and this is why they symbolize an egg, not because they're primitive, from the great fire dragon and emptied out the yoke until it was hollow. They then rolled the moon across the sky to the earth and caused cataclysmic events on this planet. They, uh, Zulu legends also say that the, the Chittahuri threatened to move the moon if humans didn't do what they said because of the devastation that would cause. What the two scientists said about this two, three mile um, out, outer kind of um, protection followed by a 20 mile impregnable layer explains one of the uh, anomalies of the moon, which the craters are, are, are pretty much of universal depth, even though the, the scale of the impact and the size of the crater are, can be massively different. The depth is about the same, uh, really, um, within a very short ratio. And that's, the scientists say, because it, it, it goes into the outer layer, the kind of buffer, but it can't go further than this inner protection layer that is impregnable. Uh, this guy, Don Wilson, wrote a book in the 70s called Our Mysterious Spaceship Moon. And um, these are some of the uh, anomalies that he, he lists, and there are others that can be explained by what we're talking about. Why the moon is a freak world too big and too far out to be a natural satellite of Earth. Why the moon has such a shallow, uh, sh shallow craters. Why some moon rocks are older than Earth and as old, at least, as the solar system. Why the moon seems inside out. Why the moon vibrates like a huge gong, transmitting tremors great distances around and through itself. How the moon can produce so many contradictions of data and uh, findings. And I think it was in 2001, um, there was a series of people uh, who spoke at the National Press Club in Washington who were insiders of uh, government uh, projects and space projects, etc., who came out to give evidence on things that they saw uh, and were covered up and have never come to light. And one of them was this man, Sergeant Carl Wolf. He was a precision electronics photographic equipment engineer based at the Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. That's the CIA Air Force Base. One of the planes of 9-11 flew out of that and never got there, weren't meant to. Um, but what he told at the press uh, club was that um, he was called across to part of this base where they were putting together what they called mosaics. As, as the um, 
uh, craft were flying over the moon and photographing it, they were taking different photographs and piecing them together to, to complete the, the, the landscape. And they had a technical problem, so he went over to try to help them out with it. And then um, a guy there who, who, who was working with his mosaics um, showed him uh, uh, something of interest. And this is, this is what he said at that um, presentation in Washington. Then he pulled out one of these mosaics and showed this base, which had geometrical shapes that were towers. They were spherical buildings. They were tall towers and things that looked somewhat like radar dishes. But they were large structures. If I compare it to what I have seen now, because I do have photographs that have uh, artifacts in them that are similar to what I saw, they're massive. And this is a thing. You think about the moon, massive. This is a thing that comes up. The, the structures and technology and, and, if you like, spaceships that these people uh, work with, some of them are absolutely enormous beyond our comprehension because they've crossed that Rubicon of understanding how reality works and therefore you, what possibility is. Some of these structures are half a mile in size. They're huge structures. Some of the buildings seem to have very reflective surfaces on them. A couple of structures that I saw reminded me of cooling towers at power generating plants. They had that, uh, that sort of shape. Some of them were just very, very straight and tall with a flat top. Some of them were round. Some of them looked like Quonset huts and, uh, with a dome, a kind of like a greenhouse. The particular shot that I saw, there were several clustered together over the landscape, a fairly large uh, landscape. And other people at that press club um, presentation talked about how NASA systematically um, smudged out or removed um, any non-natural artifacts that they showed on the surface of the moon. And this um, documentary called Moon Rising, you can watch it on YouTube, I think, um, looked at um, photographs uh, taken by uh, something called the Clementine Mission in 1994, I think it was, uh, which took 1.8 million photographs, digital photographs of the moon. And uh, you see the way that some things on the landscape were just blocked out. I mean, what's behind um, this? There's loads of these things which, which they've blocked them out. And then there's this, which has been smudged out. If you take it from another angle, there it is. What the heck is that? One of the kind of astounding things in this uh, documentary is that they said they took this picture to um, a photographic expert who's worked with, with, with NASA, and um, he estimated that this was 10 times the size of Los Angeles. Because you're, you're dealing with phenomenal uh, understanding of how to create this technology. Uh, because of the understanding of reality. And whatever it is, it doesn't, certainly doesn't seem to be natural. You've got all these other things kind of smudged out, and, and you can only see even the smudging in close-up. And what I came across when I uh, was putting this together is, is the Death Star in Star Wars. Now, George Lucas, as I've been saying in my books for years, is a massive insider in a galaxy far, far away. I don't think so. I don't think so. This is much closer to home. And of course, in the uh, Star Wars movies, the Death Star is, it looks very much, of course, like the moon. And it, it was constructed to, to move in on planets and take them over in the same bloody way that I'm talking about in uh, relation to the moon. And there's more to know, too. In many ways, this is so symbolic of what. Uh, we're looking at here, and that's no accident with George Lucas involved. And interestingly, this is Mimas, uh, a, a, a genuine moon of Saturn, and there's the Death Star. I found that quite interesting when you put them together. Anyway, the, the, there's, there was also talk, and more recently there's been further talk in the last few weeks, that one of the moons of Mars, uh, Phobos, is a hollowed out asteroid. This guy said a long time ago in 63, a chief of applied mathematics at NASA, that Phobos might be a colossal base orbiting Mars. And like I say, that's come back into the, um, the debate that it could be. And again, one of the Star Trek episodes was about a hollowed out planetoid that became, uh, in effect, a, a, a spacecraft, uh, a, a world and inside it. And so much of this science fiction that puts this stuff in our face as fiction ain't fiction at all. They're getting it from, from, from fact. Um, so like I say, there's not just incredible synchronicity in mathematics and size and position between these three uh, bodies, but as the 
authors of Who Built the Moon point out, there's great synchronicity between things like Stonehenge and other megalithic um, structures and um, these three bodies, particularly um, the moon. And one of the things they point out is that the measurement uh, which a guy called Alexander Tom came up with, an engineer who studied all these sites in Britain and Europe like Stonehenge, called the megalithic yard, which is a kind of a, a certain length. And he said that all these major, especially Stonehenge and things like that, broke down into these megalithic yard mathematics. And what the authors of this book are saying is that um, the moon breaks down to the same mathematics. This is what they say. This all seemed very odd. The megalithic structures that were built across Western Europe were frequently used to observe the movements of the sun and the moon. But how could the unit of measure upon which these structures were based be so beautifully integer to the circumference of these bodies as well as the earth? Well, maybe because those that built Stonehenge and these megalithic structures in the ancient world, some of which we'd struggle to build now, were also those controlling the moon. And, and okay, this could be controversial, but you know, I've been known to be. I, I think that um, these structures were put there to suppress the Earth's energy grid for reasons I'll come to in a moment, because we are interacting with this energy field all the time. And how do you control all the fish at once? You control the sea they're swimming in. And the way to control humanity and suppress humanity is to suppress the energy field and the energy and information available in that field that we can access. And th these fantastic structures were not done by humans alone, let's say that. Now, now this is where I am probably alone for, for the moment. I don't think I will be forever, but there you go. Um, when I was, um, I mean, I, I do this more in detail in, in the book, but I'm trying to connect dots here. What I came across when I was putting all this together, again, was something I've termed the moon matrix. The first section today is absolutely crucial to understanding how this can work. The moon matrix is a broadcast frequency coming from the moon, which has, in effect, um, hacked in to the human body computer and to the virtual reality universe in general and has created a sub-reality within the wider virtual reality. Because, I keep saying it, but it's important. We see the moon as physical, but actually its base construct, like everything else in this reality, is waveform information. And I would say, and of course I think this is going to become more obvious as, as, as the years pass, I would say the moon is actually not just what we've talked about so far, but it's an interdimensional portal through which entities and energies can come out of one reality through into this one. It's their means of entry. Its position, so perfect, as you'll see if you, if you read not just my new book, but Who Built the Moon, um, its position in relation to the moon and the sun is so perfect because that has an effect on creating this sub-reality. I'm saying that this frequency is broadcast from the moon and has created a sub-reality which we are constantly decoding and that the genetic manipulation of humanity so widely described by the ancients was to take this body computer and tune it in, connect it to this frequency range I'm calling the moon matrix. This is uh, Neil Haig's concept of moonopoly. This is the world, the structure that we are experiencing. This box recurring round and round limited world. And I am suggesting that we are being massively influenced. In fact, we have been turned into a hive mind by these broadcasts, which are holding us in a sense of limitation to the point where it operates as a default mechanism. Soon as you start to awaken, if you don't keep it going and, 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 and stick with it, then you'll default back because the pressure of this moon matrix is pushing us into this uh, tiny sense of um, limitation. So what virtual realities do 
is they basically hijack the five senses and get them to decode the information in the computer game and take it into reality. I'm saying that this moon matrix has done exactly the same and it is part of the modus operandi of how planets are taken over in this way. Our five senses have been locked into something else and we're decoding a fake reality. Basically, we are um, connected to this symbolically, which is a hive mind, uh, which is why we are so herd-like when we weren't before. Uh, you know, and if people are going, whoa, okay, what? what just stick with me, because the, the layers will go on. What, um, what I've been talking about today is the fact that this base vibration from the black holes uh, goes through this cycle and it elicits different information in the form of photons from the suns which we decode and the reality changes we go through different epochs what I'm saying is that this moon matrix has hacked in to that photon energy um, stream and has done what the Chinese authorities have done uh, to the computer system in China they have stopped us accessing vast amounts of the virtual reality universe that we used to uh, before now, if anyone thinks this is fantastic, that, that we could see things that aren't really there and not see things that aren't there, this is a new scientist. America has just switched from analog to digital television. In the short time of about a year that the analog uh, frequencies are not being accessed because they're going to be filled up by other things like mobile phones, suddenly, for the first time, scientists can see and connect with radio waves from galaxies they couldn't before. Why couldn't they do it before? Because we were watching the flipping telly. Prior to the switchover in America, naturally occurring radio waves at frequencies between 700 and 800 megahertz were obscured by analog TV signals, preventing astronomers from investigating the universe using this band. The freeing up of this bandwidth is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see galaxies in this range. Now, you imagine what is capable by these, this high technology in blocking frequencies so we can't perceive what's there and we perceive things that aren't there. That's what this is doing, I suggest. And I'll add more detail as we go along. In effect, we're operating within a bubble, a virtual reality bubble, within the wider virtual reality universe. And it's connecting in through our crystalline receiver transmission system, same with the Earth, and creating this situation where we are decoding a world that may be even not be there, who knows, but certainly is different to the world we think it is. And we go back to this more accurately now. The matrix, I would say the moon matrix, is everywhere. It is all around us, even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out of your window and you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that, world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? You are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison. You cannot smell, taste, or touch a prison for your mind. I would say that prison for your mind is the moon matrix, we, which has put us in a vibrational prison that we can only break out of by becoming conscious and therefore vibrating beyond the walls of the moon matrix, which is a frequency range. And if we're not held in that frequency range, that's why society is structured as it is, with its stress and its fear and its war and its conflict, then we start to break out of its perception prison and we start to say, bloody hell, why didn't I see this before? Because you were there, constantly decoding this thing. Now, like I was just saying, never mind what I've just said about some moon matrix, never mind that, even by its very position, the moon is fundamentally affecting human behavior and human perception. Because the moon is affecting the Earth uh, tilt, the Earth spin, it's affecting the Earth oceans, therefore it's affecting us. We're 60, 70 percent water, we must be affected by it. And also, and here we come back to the importance of the first section today, it's also fundamentally affecting the um, endocrine system, which connects us to the chakra system, which connects us to out there, part of which is the third eye. It affects the, the hormones that we secrete. Uh, which fundamentally affect human behavior, human health, human perception. Not with any matrix, just by being there. And it fundamentally affects this, the uh, pituitary and the pineal gland that give us the sixth sense ability to see beyond the five senses. And what it has done, it has shut down in so many people, on purpose, the third eye, which in our previous 
pre-domination mode, we used to perceive vast areas of reality beyond what, which, we, uh, which we can now. Moon comes from moon. The moon, of course, as it goes around, fundamentally affects our perception of time. We have moons because of the moon. It's a moonarchy. It's a hybrid moonarchy, monarchy. And one of the major ways they control us, seems to be a modus operandi again, is moony, money, controlled by the Rothschilds. Now, I saw a movie, film, <laughs> some years ago, <laughs> called They Live. It was a B-movie, and it was not just produced and directed, he wrote the music, every bloody thing, by a guy called John Carpenter. You follow John Carpenter's uh, movie-making history, and you will see that he's, he bloody knows a great deal. He will say he doesn't, he bloody knows a great deal. He, he, he does movies and horrors and Satanism and all this stuff, and he did this movie called They Live, and I, I thought it was very symbolically accurate when I first saw it, but now it's unbelievably accurate. For those who haven't seen it, you go on YouTube, put John Carpenter, they live in, you can see it in sections still today. The story was this, it was set in the future, but the future was about now, because it was a few years ago now. There was a massive economic depression, and this guy comes along uh, with his tools on his back, he's walking around America trying to find a job in the building industry. He gets a, a, a one, a short-term one at this building site. Um, at the end of the day, one of the... One of the uh, other builders said, do you have anywhere to stay? Because there's a ma massive economic depression. People are living in tents, cities, and corrugated iron um, uh, makeshift uh, villages on wasteland. Exactly what's happening in America now, incidentally. And he's now having nowhere to stay. So anyway, he goes back with him to stay at this corrugated iron tent little village thing on, on, a, on the wasteland. And he starts getting interested because there's things going on across the church, across the way that seem very strange to him. And the, the, the village has mocked up some kind of uh, television uh, in, a, in a kind of Heath Robinson way and when they're watching the television suddenly it breaks out of the main channel and there's just a man's face on the screen saying they're here they're controlling you don't know that all that stuff and then there's a there's a police state raid on this village and on this church and they they bring the bulldozers in and the police and the helicopters and they, they destroy the village and this builder guy gets away and he comes back and he goes snooping around the church and he finds some uh, cardboard boxes and uh, he grabs one um, and, and runs into a, a, a back, back uh, a passage uh, behind buildings. And he opens the box wondering what's in it. And there's sunglasses. And he's disappointed. Sunglasses? What are these sunglasses in a church for? So he thinks, oh, I'll have one. He puts them in his pocket, throws the others away, walks off into the street. And that's where we pick him up. When he puts these sunglasses on, suddenly the world looks very, very different. It looks like this. He starts to realize that there are people that look human to his naked eye that are anything but human when he puts these sunglasses on. Not only that, where he's seeing adverts with his naked eye, drink Coca-Cola, holiday in Jamaica or whatever, what he can see with the glasses on is subliminal instructions, conform, stay asleep, consume, watch TV, submit, and all the rest of it. All on levels that he can't see. Other people who haven't got the glasses, they're interacting with various people, but he can see are not human. He looks at the president making a speech. He's not human when he looks at him through the glasses. Same with a number of people in law enforcement. Uh, news readers were the same. And the, where, it, where it goes is that at the end of the movie, they realize that the reason that people cannot see without the glasses, um, what he can see is because there is a frequency being transmitted from the top of a television tower which is pre preventing the population seeing what they would normally see if that frequency wasn't being broadcast. And what they do is they break the, the broadcast frequency, they, 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 they stop the dish working, and people are sitting in bars, and suddenly they can now see the guy next to them's not human. What a bloody laugh that would be, wouldn't it? And there's people out having sex and then realizing, hey, I, I didn't really come home with you. Tell you the funny thing, a lady in Canada told me this t story happened to her. I spoke in Canada years ago now, and I met this lady. She was a, a, a power-dressing businesswoman, you know, very of this world. But she'd had this experience, and she was shaking when she told me the story. Um, she said that um, she got this, this, this boyfriend who had a dark side, she said, 
who, who, that he, he, he knew about and he was trying to deal with. And they come home and they go into the bedroom and there was a, there was a, a shelf at at top of her bed and standing there was the book The Biggest Secret, which for, for the first time I introduced this reptilian thing. He then goes crazy, she said, when he sees the book and he, he got her to throw it away. Oh, what are you reading that rubbish for and all that stuff? Mind you, he's not alone in that. Um, and then they start having sex and he, he's kind of on top of her and she said, I had my hand on the, the bottom of his back and suddenly he started getting very, very violent and I started getting frightened. And she said, then I, I, my hand was pushed back. And she said, I looked over his shoulder and, and my hand had been pushed back by a tail. He sprouted a tail. She said, I screamed, threw him off and he, for a second or two in front of me, he was totally reptilian and then morphed back to human and ran out of the house, never seen him again. But these bizarre stories um, that are bizarre to our reality, I've been told all over the world by people from all different walks of life, people in the Swiss banking system and all that stuff, all different kinds of people. So um, this frequency is that equivalent of that broadcast dish on the top of that TV tower, which was stopping those people in that movie seeing what they would normally see. Now, when we bring this down into the reptilian world, well, it gets interesting because we live in a society that is a expression of the reptilian brain. This man, Carl Sagan, a cosmologist, very famous, he wrote a book called The Dragons of Eden, in which he was looking at the effect of reptilian genetics on human behavior. And he uh, said, you cannot, in effect, understand human behavior without understanding the reptilian aspect of, of, of all this. And we come back to what I mentioned earlier. This part of the brain, known as the reptilian brain or the R complex to scientists, is so fundamental to human behavior, as, as I'll explain in a second. And I'm saying that this genetic manipulation that the ancients talk about in, all over the world by the serpent gods locked us in to the moon matrix through the reptilian brain because it connects into the hive mind of the reptilian species in the moon. And this, like I say, fundamentally expresses itself as the world um, that we live in. And I'll, I'll come to that more in a second. Now, in the 60s, around that time, there's a guy called Carlos Castaneda who wrote books based on the teachings uh, of, a, of a Central American shaman source called Don Juan Matos. Um, some people say Don Juan didn't exist. Some people say he did. Whatever, the words that were put into his mouth are just absolutely extreme, extraordinarily accurate. And I read this quote coming up after I put this stuff together that I've been talking about. Um, this is what Don Juan Matus said in, in these books. We have a predator that came from the depth of the cosmos and took over the rule of our lives. Human beings and its prison, are its prisoners. The predator is our lord and master. It has rendered us docile, helpless. If we want to protest, it suppresses our protest. If we want to act independently, it demands that we don't do so. Indeed, we are held prisoner. They took us over because we are food to them, and they squeeze us mercilessly because we are their sustenance. Just as we rear chickens in coops, the predators rear us in human coops, human eros. Therefore, their food is always available to them. Think for a moment and tell me how you would explain the contradictions between the intelligence of man the engineer and the stupidity of his systems of belief or the stupidity of his contradictory behavior. Sorcerers believe that the predators have given us our systems of beliefs, our ideas of good and evil, our social mores. They are the ones who set up our dreams of success or failure. They have given us covetedness, greed, and cowardice. It is the predator who makes us complacent, routinary, and egomanical. In order to keep us obedient and meek and weak, the predators have engaged themselves in a stupendous maneuver. Stupendous, of course, from the point of view of a fighting strategist, a horrendous maneuver from the point of those who suffer it. They gave us their mind. The predator's mind is baroque, contradictory, morose, 
filled with the fear of being discovered any minute now. They gave us their mind, and that is how I suggest they've done it. We are connected if we operate within the hive reptilian brain mind. We are operating on a collective mind, which is pouring out this constant sense of anxiety, fear, worry, stress, because that A keeps us within the confines of the frequency range of the moon matrix, i.e. attached to it, and it also um, elicits the emotional low vibrational energy on which they feed. Behind all these pyramids of banking, medicine, religion, business, politics, is the reptilian hive mind. It connects into all these control systems that run our society. And now let's look at the character traits of the reptilian brain. Is this our society or what? This is mainstream science, by the way. From the reptilian brain, we get primitive and emotional responses. Cold-blooded behavior, lack of empathy, if not balanced out by other parts of the brain. And territoriality, this is mine, get out. A desire to control, an obsession with hierarchical structures of power. Aggression, might is right, winner takes all. And it is dominating our sense of reality and our reaction and responses to events and other people. This is the word that sums up the reptilian brain, survive, survival. It doesn't think, it hasn't got the ability to think, it reacts. That's why it can react so fast. There are good things about it. When you're driving along in your car and someone walks in front of you, what rams the anchors on immediately without thinking, instantly, is the reptilian brain. But when that starts to impact on other parts of our behavior and our lives, then it becomes a very negative thing indeed. It is the reptilian brain and its fear of not surviving. It's always scanning the environment for threats, not just physical threats, but threats on other, in, in other levels of, of our um, experience, which I'll, which I'll uh, explain in a second. And therefore, the targeting of the reptilian brain and the constant triggering it, of, of it is what gives us this constant fear, this constant stress, worry that goes on in all areas of our lives. Will I meet the rent at the end of the month? Oh my good, will I lose my job? Oh my God. And the more that we can be put in fear, here we go, the more we operate in the reptilian brain. That's why we're constantly given reasons to fear and to be anxious. Be afraid, be very afraid. The big bag monster's coming as soon as we've invented him. And when he's gone, we'll have another. Terrorism, ah! Global warming, ah! Swine flu, ah! The economy, ah! I don't look like her, ah! I don't look like him, ah! Constant, constant reasons to fear. locking us into the control system. And it's not just physical survival, it's survival of status, of power, of reputation, superiority, intellectual preeminence, acquiescence to a hierarchy and authority is another aspect of the reptilian brain. I know my place. And you know, when, 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 when you put information out that challenges the, 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 the status quo view of scientists and academics, they react vehemently. Why? Because the reptilian brains kicked in. Survival of their reputation, survival of their belief system. When you uh, put out information that challenges people's religious beliefs, not you're saying you're wrong and all that stuff, you're just saying here's some information, which if it's true, that, 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 that can't, be, can't be right. They vehemently attack you. Why? Because the reptilian brains kicked in, because the belief system is uh, in danger of not surviving. Uh, fear of money. Money is... Uh, fundamentally reptilian brain, uh, two, two polarities of it. One, fear of not surviving, fear of not having enough to pay the rent, to eat. And on the other hand, you can get so locked into the reptilian brain, and this is what the, um, the hybrid bloodlines do, that you equate survival with far more than is necessary to survive. 
So you get people, especially in these bloodline networks, who have got more money than they could spend in a hundred lifetimes, but they get up with the sun every morning to go and earn bloody more. It's an obsession, it's an addiction, and it's connected to the reptilian brain, which fundamentally drives our perception of reality. Don Juan Matus again. I know that even now, though you never have suffered hunger, you have hunger and food anxiety which is none other than the anxiety of the predator who fears that at any moment now its maneuver is going to be uncovered and food is going to be denied. Through the mind, which after all is their mind, the predators inject into the lives of human beings whatever is convenient for them and they ensure in this manner a degree of security to act as a buffer against this fear. Sorcerers of ancient Mexico reasoned here we go that man must have been a complete being at one point, with stupendous insights, feats of awareness, that are mythological legends nowadays. And then everything seems to disappear, and we now have a sedated man. What I'm saying is, what we have against us is not a simple predator. It is very smart and organized. It follows a methodical system to render us useless. Modus operandi, done it many times. Man, the magical being that he is destined to be, He's no longer magical. He is an average piece of meat. There are no more dreams for man, but the dreams of an animal who is being raised to be a piece of meat, trite, conventional, imbecilic. This is what becoming conscious brings us out of. Control of perception is the bottom line of this conspiracy. You know, I'm all for exposing 9-11s and banking scams and not engineered wars, but this is the bottom line. And if we miss it, then we're going round in circles and we'll get nowhere. Interestingly, the Zulu legends say that before the moon came, they used to worship the sun as female, and then everything changed. This change from perceiving the sun as female to worshiping it as male made possible the creation of warlike kings that took what they wanted by force. Everything changed when the perception of the sun changed, and the perception of the sun changed when the moon matrix kicked in and changed our perception of everything. And in so many ways, this Avatar movie, I'm not saying Cameron symbolized it like this, I'm saying what it symbolized to me. The blue people who were in total harmony with everything else, I'm saying to me are symbolic of humans as we were before the predator came. And then the American troops with their high technology, let's kill people, we want these resources, so let's just go and get them and destroy everything to do so. They symbolize to me this reptilian intervention. And they even have in the Avatar movie, of course, the concept of the possession of the blue people so that they could infiltrate their society while outwardly looking like they do and not being uh, known to be who they are. These reptilians look down a different timeline to us because they're, they're on a different wavelength. They're able to see further into what we call the future than we are. And therefore, if you access this network of secret societies, especially the inner circle, you can access the projected future of human society which this is planning. Therefore, you can write prophetic novels which further down what we call the timeline turn out to be staggeringly accurate. All you need to do is to access that projection. And you do it by accessing the secret society network. This, the Fabian Society in London, created in 1884, is one of those societies. It, the deeper inner core that have access to that timeline and that projected agenda. And this guy was one of them, a Fabian. And that's the Fabian logo, by the way, the wolf in sheep's clothing, perfect, perfect. It created, in effect, the Labour Party in Britain and it influences uh, massively uh, the, the left, not only the left, but what we call the left center of politics, not just in Britain, but in other countries. Australia too, for instance, very, very powerfully. When people have said to me in the past, you know, what, what's planned, I've said to them, well, you can read two books and see it, just put them together. George Orwell's 1984, and Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. This was uh, published in 1948, this was in 1932. 
Uh, put the two together, this talks about the drugs and, and, and all the rest of it, and the mind control. This talks about the, the sort of police state. Put them together, you got it. They were incredibly prophetic. I've been saying for years they weren't novels, or that their source wasn't novels. Turns out that Aldous Suxley taught French to a man called Eric Blair then, now uh, George Orwell, at Eton College, and introduced him to the Fabian Society. And this was the knowledge 